it figures the first stream of <laughs> and i forget to unmute my mic at the beginning hi this is end commander and welcome to the first stream of the season two and trust me i've got a lot to cover here today so um yeah chat's just catching up hopefully the stream behaves i've already had some technical go um trouble so Today we're doing something a little bit different. This is my IBM info window, and I hit control C here. And this is going, and you can hear the model M I'm typing with. This, let's see here, PDP 11 boot.in. And then we're gonna run Unix. This is a Raspberry Pi that we're gonna be using as a PDP 11. And now you may be asking, well, why would you do such a thing? And the reason for that, and let's switch over to the desktop, is we are going to try and compile 50 year old source code. And I just realized that my microphone is on stereo and this is a mono mic. I don't, yeah, hold on. Yep, there we go, fixed. And uh, as you may notice, I'm having some streaming issues because this is the first time I'm streaming off the MacBook and it's going to be fun. Um, I have moved off Linux for video production entirely. The app solution, which is directly behind me, is now running Windows, uh, and I'm running this one off the MacBook because I'm actually going to be using the serial terminal. So the goal for this stream is to successfully try and build Network Unix v6. And there is a getting started guide, it's not very useful because I'm literally dealing with a system that is over a decade older than I am, um, more so in places. And yes, this is an M2 MacBook Pro 13 inch. Um, I've had it for a while. I think I got it in July because I know I've shown it on other streams. So, um, and to answer some questions, I did make it all the way to Boston. Uh, the next Restless Yankee video will drop on publicly, I believe on Monday. And then probably in a month, I will do a conclusions video. But one of the things I've decided I wanted to do was I wanted to look a lot into the history of ARPANET and the early internet. And this is where I've discovered that pretty much everything related to ARPANET, at least its first iteration is more or less gone. This is one of two copies of ARPANET software that I've been able to track down. And it is the only one in a high level programming language. This is RIN in C. I've got to play with the volume. Hold on a moment. I will just tell you I had real obscenities trying to get audio working on the MacBook. So one, like I said, one of these days. Anyway, um, I was looking into the original ARPANET network stack software. Um, there were quite a few of these. Um, this is a modified version of V6 Unix that will, was used on ARPANET. I believe it, from what I can tell from the comments, it came from, if I go all the way down, uh, was it here? It's in one of the header files, it talks about it. Um, this was from the University of Illinois. I'm not certain if they're the ones who coded it, but that is where this archive came from. And it has most of the ARPANET commands that I have found referenced in the IETF documentation. Like here's the original FTP client right here. We've got the mail client, which back in these days, the mail client was an extension of um, TCP, uh, FTP. Okay, uh, if the volume, here I can turn the volume up a little bit. Is that better? Mic check? Yeah. Okay, testing, okay. So this is the original ARPANET code. Um, and you can see the modified for Illinois NCP. NCP is network control protocol. Uh, it was the protocol that was used on ARPANET before TCP IP. Um, most of the code I think comes from 78 and 79 but i have no real backstory to this and there's no compiled copies so the goal of this stream 
is to successfully get this code loaded back into a correct uh, a period correct Unix system. We need a V6 system, and then we're going to try and compile it. We will not be able to go online with it because the original ARPANET used something called the Interface Message Protocol or uh, Processor or IMP, which was essentially it was a modified Honeywell H316, if I remember correctly. Um, and while the firmware for those machines exist, there has been no attempt to try and get it running, get them running in such a way that you'd be able to route packets. So mostly trying to get this compiled is a lot of history stuff. Like one of the really unusual things is like in this period of ARPANET, there was no expectation of privacy. In fact, every email sent on the system was sent into what's called the Snoop mailbox. So the system administrator could essentially eavesdrop. And this is documented. Private email probably wasn't a thing until the mid 80s. There was no Usenet in this time period. Um, you had Telnet, you had FTP. Uh, I don't have an implementation for it, but there was, um, like I have Telnet right here. Uh, there was network card reader, which was to put a punch card reader on the network. There was remote job submission service. Again, I don't have, uh, that one I have a daemon for, but it's not here. That one's in um, ITS. And there was a couple of other odds and ends um, that, by and large, I, like, can't find anything about. Like, if you look at the FTP server daemon, um, you can see all sorts of things. Like, this is how email was sent back in these days. Instead of having SMTP as we do, um, the mail program, which was called send message, would actually connect to the FTP port and send a mail command. And then this was replaced with deliver mail. Uh, 82, I believe, was when deliver mail became a thing. And then SMTP, and then send mail was commissioned to try and sort out the train wreck that was ARPANET email. Because it had to connect with ARPANET, it had to connect with BERKNET, it had to connect with UUCP. Um, there's a reason why sendmail.cf is a horrific horrific thing so um yeah we are going to be using SimH for this so um if i switch the camera back around switch the camera back around so um if we detach from terminal so this is just a raspberry pi that looks really <laughs> okay i gotta admit that looks really cool on a terminal although it's a little bit um big um, but I've loaded the code here. Here's the problem we run into. So let me go back into screen. Um, I don't have a tar command. I don't have CPIO. I have TP, which I believe is called is tape program. I've gotten this to work, but it doesn't work well. I do have dump and restore, but they're incompatible with any format I can find. So I have a bit of a data entry problem. The easiest way I can think we are going to be able to do this is probably by building a v7 unix system extracting the tar uh the tar files which uh is where I got this onto a v7 system loading that back into a v6 system and more but we're going to have to manually install unix uh version 7 unix we're going to have to reconfigure it to use the correct disk drives because let me show you what was used. So in the era of early Unix, you had what was, this wasn't the only drive storage, but this was like the most common. Um, you had what was called the RK05 and essentially it's a giant floppy disk. Um, they had these removable disk cartridges that each held about 2.5 megabytes of data each. Uh, one would hold the root partition, the other one would hold the user partition, and I believe you could daisy chain up to eight of them, although you would have a lot, you, you'd be a really well-equipped shop if you had more than like two. By time version seven Unix had come around, this, I just realized I had that on the wrong view. Hold on, let's bring that up. Uh, desktop. There we go. 
Uh, yeah, so this is the RK05, and you can see here, there's the removable disc platter. It's, it was also known as the deck pack. Um, we the, as far as IO goes, we have the RK05. Sorry, that was something outside. I think that's the trash being taken out. Uh, we had the RK05, and we had magnetic tape storage. And that's about it. There are a couple of other larger storage devices. Um, if when you get around to version seven Unix, by and large, they were using RL devices from what I've seen, which are five and 10 megabytes respectively. So we're going to have to install version seven Unix. We're going to have to compile in the um, RK driver and then try and do data exchange. As far as I know, it will work because the file system did not change between version six and version seven, as far as I can tell. So what we're gonna start here, um, let me find it first, let's see here. We are gonna start with building a version seven Unix system and I will drop the link to this in chat. Um, version seven was the last version from Bell Labs um it's probably the one that actually resembles modern unix v6 actually doesn't which was kind of surprising uh there is an install guide well there's sort of an install guide let me see if i can find the better install guide yeah here it is so this talks about loading the tape and all that so for a little bit more authenticity i'm going to do this on a glass terminal it's not what would have been used at the time. What would have been used at the time would by far been a teletype, but I don't have one. So we're going with the next best thing. Glass terminals did exist in this time period. They just were very rare and very expensive. So I think that I think that's enough prelude. It should explain more or less everything to this point. So let's get to it so let's make a new um v7 directory all right and i should have yeah i have the v7 unix tape here so the first step we're going to have to do is we need to configure our system more or less to boot from tape so let's create a tape install file and hopefully this is visible on stream so the first thing we, we need to do is we need to tell it that we're a PDP 1145, which was the minimum requirements. The CPU is allowed to idle. We have an RP0, uh, we have an RP6 drive. We set that to attention. This is the disk pack, disk. And then we load the tape in the magnetic tape storage. And, uh, Backspace is not working correctly. I'm hopefully that will not be a problem. Unix v7 and then boot tm0. All right, so let's write that. So tape i in. Okay, so let's fire up our simulated PDP 11 and see how far we go. So if I did this correctly, which uh, I should not try and type and talk at the same time. So it's going to create the disk. And then... There it goes. Okay. So that's successfully loaded from tape. So the right now we have a minimal bootstrap program in the PDP-11's memory. Uh, and what we need to tell it to do now is... Let's see. You're looking the simulator creating new file override last track i think we can just tell it to boot from tape so we want to boot from tape record three because this has the format command on it so we are formatting a five megabyte system it's device hp00 and then exit okay so that formatted it and now we can copy the tape over so four, tape, uh, we want to copy tape record five. We want to copy to the root partition. Last chance before scribbling the di on disk. 
Okay. This will take about half a minute. Uh, SimH does not accurately um, simulate IO. It runs much faster than it would period correct. Like that probably would have taken about, it would have taken a long time on real hardware. So now we're back into the bootloader. Now we can tell it we want to boot from uh, main device. And we are now in a running system in single user mode. So first thing we got to do is we need to configure the terminal. So an interesting quirk, there is no backspace. Or uh, is this a patched one? Okay, this is a patched, uh, not patched one. It was V6 that doesn't know backspace. This one does know backspace. So disregard what I just said. So now we've got, we're in the boot system. We need to configure, we need to put the bootstrap kernel here. Uh, and the HP Unix, Unix, there we go. Uh, I think we can just toss the other ones. I don't think we need them. I mean, I probably will regret that, but disk space is going to be um problematic Let's see here arm ht unix okay so that handles all that next we need to create the device nodes this is fortunately got a make file which helps um make the tape device nodes like that okay all right now we need to install we need to do the user partition so that is x makefs dev rp3 i'm really hoping this document is correct cannot execute where did i go wrong all right let's rp3 Three two 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 seven eight. Did I make a typo the first time? All right, so that's formatting the user partition. <sighs> okay. Um, the thing is that V six Unix was not designed for a glass terminal. It was designed for a teletype. There was physically no backspace functionality at that time because it didn't exist uh v7 has it apparently like if i was to do ccc and then do yeah see it's it looks like it's supported but it's not actually watched so if i do a hash sign um no that is actually correct so here let me show you so if i do cc hash hash because the hash sign is the backspace ls, it runs ls. The at sign kills the line, um, and these are key inputs that were used in Multic. So I was right, there is no backspace in this version. All right, so the next step we gotta do is we gotta run I check on our newly formatted partition. RP3. Okay. I, I really do need, um, so fancy 2209. So what I have is the patch, uh, essentially it's a patch kit to the original Bell Unix V6. I have it in source code form. It looks like it was shipped as a distribution magnetic tape. So I have to load, but it's in a modern format. It isn't in something I can just load into V6 Unix. I have to convert it into something. I, I should be able to extract that tape onto V7 and either convert it to a V6 format or hopefully I can just eject and reload. I, it is possible to compile it on V7. It actually looks like they were doing that, but I'd rather not tempt fate if I can avoid it because I do that enough on this channel. So... The last thing we need to do is we need to advance the installation tape because the tape, uh, I believe the tape is currently at the start of the root partition. I believe it rewound when um, earlier. So we need to tell it to use the no rewind 
uh, we need help to reset the tape. We can do this with DD, and then we're just going to read it into dev null. Byte size file six. Yeah, we want to advance to the start of the sixth tape, and there we go. And now we should just be able to run restore rf dev rmt zero. That's fine. And then that will just run the restore. I should put a V in there, but whatever. All right. So now we just wait until it says, um, until we're done, until it's done restoring. So, yeah, so the hash sign was used to fix typos back in the day. Um, there is no Vi in this version. The only editor is the standard Unix editor known as Ed. Like I said, using a glass terminal is not period correct. I just don't have a teletype. Um, by and large, many computers were not, glass terminals were not common on many computers. I won't say they weren't used, but they were not common. Um... Glass terminals were mostly reserved for what we would call mainframes in this day and age, such as the TN 3270 or uh, the 3270 IBM terminals. There was the 2230. Deck had a couple of graphic terminals from this time period, but uh, I I think it would have been the VT 52 for this period, and HP had a few, but like the terminals themselves would have cost almost as much as a mini computer would have in and of itself so now that we've got the user partition restored rp3 user okay we have the user partition so let's so now we need to install the boot record uh no i got that right Oh, um, machine dependent boot rp0, rp0 count one. Okay, that handles that. There is no reboot command in this version. You just sync it a whole bunch of times and kind of pray it worked. Okay, so now we bail out the emulator. Uh, it is, I'm using SimH running on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, it just happens. It's actually the same Raspberry Pi that I use for ham radio. Uh, if you looked earlier, you could have seen a bunch of ham stuff in my home folder. Okay, so now we need to create the... We need to configure for normal booting. I love watching Vi draw, draw in. This is running at 9600, I, which is about the minimum I consider usable by modern standards. Although, there's people who have suffered through far worse. And we get to upgrade to a more interesting machine. Um, or I shouldn't say more interesting, but marginally more powerful because by and large what would happen is when someplace a site wanted to set up unix someone would basically have to come out and do it it, it wasn't like plug and play and when we install v6 later i will show you how complicated this process gets because this is easy mode all right disk boot rp0 uh, all right, let's see if it boots. All right, so I should get the boot prompt here if I did it correctly. If I didn't do it correctly, well, that's what it will do. Uh, or can I, is it, do I just type, oh, I guess I just type boot there, okay. That note could be a little clearer. And then we just tell it we want to boot Unix. And this will drop us into single user mode. We send a control D. And there we have it. We are now in, we've now got a successful multi-user boot. Okay. So, um, yeah. So one interesting thing about this is if you read this carefully, it says restricted rights, use duplication or disclosure is subject to resistant uh, restrictions stated with your contract with Western Electric Company, Inc. So why this is a bit interesting is um, AT&T, when Unix was first being developed, was considered a monopoly by the United States. They were forbidden by law 
from entering the computer market. So Bell Labs more or less was operating, um, this more or less was a research division. Certain copies of these six units were distributed to academia, but the license was not very clear, so it got used as a teaching tool. This That's why the Lines book was built around V6 Unix. AT&T gave up their monopoly of the phone system to enter the computer market, and their manufacturing arm, Western Electronic, uh, 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 Western Electrical, handled the early Unix stuff. I believe I've seen similar copyright messages on some of the uh, FreeB1 and FreeB2 stuff. I don't know if I've actually seen any under the AT&T brand directly. So, let's log in as root. There is no path. Uh, there should be a path. What? Uh, there's, there should not be a password on this. Okay, fine. Uh, I guess we're going to do the forgotten password thing. Quit. Because we can get into single user. It's not going to be happy I did a hard shutdown there. What did I install that has a path? Uh, let's see here. Sit, kill line. City L case. Because I have to set the terminal up. Do we... There is a password on this one. Okay. And I have mail? Secret mail has arrived. I'm... Okay, then. Um, was man on this version? I don't remember. I want... I do want... We are going to need to set the clock. Oh, that was useful. Fortunately, we're in... So... The thing is that nothing has support for page breaks because this would have literally just gone printed out to paper. Fortunately, we're in screen, which lets me turn time backwards. Um, yeah, so let's set the clock to, I don't know, uh, 80.01.01. Yeah, that's good enough. Okay. Ugh. All right, so now uh, I guess while we're here, I should give a very brief tour of the system. So there are a couple of games, actually. Uh, there is actually Fortune on this system. That could be dangerous because there are some, shall we say, risky fortunes. Although from this time period, it's probably, probably okay. Wow, I feel like I'm tempting fate with that sentence. Uh, like if I want to hunt the wump, wampus, let's see here. Uh, I smell a wampus. That means it's actually one room away. So let's just try a shoot. Eight, zero. Five. Oh, is it like that? Okay, so no, it's not an eight. So let's go back to six. So the goal of hunt the wampus is to well hunt the wampus. Uh, five, seven, eight, zero. Like, I think if I go to five, I'm going to die. It's not. So hey, the wampus has to be in seven. Is it like shoot seven? Okay, that's fine. Um, the problem with fortunes is they, some of them are, I might get YouTube content, uh, content flag for them. I, I, from this era, it's probably okay, but some of the ones that are in the BSDs are kind of bordering on something you might see on say 4chan or worse. I, 
a lot of the modern ones have been cleaned up, but I've seen some really bad ones. So I don't really want to run it. So um, I'm guessing the next thing, we don't have user add on this. Yeah, let me just make sure. User, no. So if we wanted to do like a non, non root user, I would just have to add it to the password file directly. And yes, I actually have to use ed for this. Uh, so append eight letters. I'll take UID 100 user M K um, is it print? Oh, I'm um, damn it. Hold on list. I'm probably still in input mode. Uh, five through eight. Yeah, that's what I thought. Eight delete, eight delete, eight delete. Delete. I mean, I could do multiple at a time, but okay. Write file. Well, I successfully put something in the user file with Ed. <laughs> Let's log out and see if we can actually no directory. Okay, cool. So I didn't completely screw that up. Why is it saying no directory? I have the, did I put it in the wrong place? Password, UID, group ID. Um, running NetHack would be a challenge for this system. I mean, the first version of Rogue was on the Vax. Binaries on this version of Unix could use theoretically 64 kilobytes of instruction and data space. It was a segmented memory architecture. I mean, maybe it was 256, but I think it was 128. It's it's a 16-bit architecture. Um. So I think the first, I think that's enough for now. So the first thing we really need to do is we actually need to relink the kernel. Uh, and to do that, amazingly, I have actually done this once before. Not on this system, but I have done it on something very similar. We need to use the make config program. Which is a little bit easier said than done. So I believe right now, RP1 config. That has RPDH, DH, so RPDH swap, swap LO, and the tape device. Uh, I actually, hold on, I need to figure out which one we are. We're the HP device, so that's us right there. So we're HP TM comp. Um, and then Yeah, so we need to append that file. So let me make a copy of it. So our config. Because we need to add a device driver. We need to add the RK05 data pack to this. Although I'm sort of thinking before I do that, I kind of want to see if I can successfully at least read the magnetic tape. So let me make a new terminal. And let me, let me, give me a moment. Let me copy over the NOS source to the Pi. Uh, let's see here. So NOS tar dot one two three oh fourteen 
source. Or I'll just copy it to the home folder. Um, okay, cool. Let's see here. So, source. Yeah. Uh, and then we need to, actually, before I extract it, you probably just extract, like, the folder. You're, yeah, you do. I am glad I checked that. Uh, please control C. There we go. There, there is some latency doing this over a serial terminal. Uh, and also C and then tar extract. Okay. And then we need to repack this as a V5 tar. Okay, so we'll just let that run. Have we been having autofocus problems? I mean, it looks fine to me, but that's me. Uh, all right, so now we got that. So there's all the source code we're going to need. So uh, there is an option in tar to do like V7. Uh, something broke. Ooh, something broke. Okay, the terminal is still working. So what crashed? Uh, folks, can I get an F in chat? Something broke. All right, let me turn the terminal off. I'm just noticing that my battery power is going down. Oh, hold on. I just, I'm going to be right back. I have to switch the charger. Probably throttling because it's down to seven percent. Right, are you charging now? Battery is not charging. Why is battery not charging? Uh, what cable? Is that better or worse? I can't tell. Keeps going in and out of focus. Uh, I can lock the focus. See, macro, manual focus. Okay. Just lock the focus. Let me solve this power problem and then we will get back to it. Why is battery not charging? Is it because you're... Uh, the mic is going to cut out for a moment. Just bear with me on this one. Oh, you know, I can't do that because... What I need is more USB ports. That's what I need. All right. Uh, let me keep an eye on that, but I think it's going to be okay. All right. So, okay, you are now responding. So whatever I did locked the terminal, but it didn't break anything. Uh, cool. Um, so what we need right now is we need a... We have to recreate this as a V7 archive tar. So that's done with the format command. I just got to look up the right option. I'm not checking this on the other terminal. Um, format. Dash H. Okay, so we need to do tar dash h v7 create from uh from here 
All right, so let that do its thing. Uh, how's my battery? Okay, my battery is now going back up. Yeah, well, the battery was down to 8% because the battery, uh, it was plugged into an unofficial charger. I just had the wires mixed up. Um, so it seems to be holding its data rate now. Hopefully it stays that way. So now we've got that hooked up. If I send a control H here, I can attach a tape and there is a way in sim H to attach a tar tape um directly just need to remember how you do it so i've got the command for it uh so attention tm0 tar let me put this yeah okay uh Wow, I can type. Okay, scanned in as tar format. Resume. So if I do a TM0 tar, can I just do tar TF or TM0? T, uh, M, M, T, zero. Directory checksum error. I mean, it read the, that was kind of what I was afraid it was going to do. Let me see if I can extract it. I've heard that this is actually a non-fatal error, but I don't know if that's actually true. So, MT0 extract. Directory checksum error. See, this was what I was afraid of. So what is going on here? I gave it slash v7. Uh, I guess it's not in that folder. Uh... Tar Archive. I fought Tar Archives by by and large it would have said old Tar Archive. There may be a problem. I remember I've had this problem before with very old Tars. I don't think it's likely but maybe yeah POSIX po Tar Archive. It's, it's too new. Um, this is what I was kind of afraid of. We have to get that tape over. So let's figure out what else I can do. Uh... Let's get a better error message. So if we let's see here, TM zero dash V dash F tar. So 411 records, one tape mark, which is exactly what I expect to see because physical tapes have when, when you run tar in an actual tape there is a binary record that has to be ran to the tape so that that is correct um so what am i missing if i keep reading along this thread if i do 
Tar TV zero directory checksum error. Is there a way I can just tell it to keep going? All right, let me, I'll let it dump out the man page and then I can read it in the back scroll. Let's see here. Can't resolve links. Next argument. Does his work silently. Creates a new tar or new tape. Kind of what I was afraid of. All right. Uh, yeah. So on magnetic tape, there's special beginning and end of records. There's also individual file ones that can be read at high speed that lets the tape drive seek that are not in the binary format. That's why you just can't. Well, you can, but there's complications. It's more or less why on these you can't just DD um, what you need. Let me see. So it looks like part of this may be caused by what's known as a blocking error. How many files are supposed to be in here? 636. Uh, let's switch the blocking factor. So that would be attach TM0 tar 512. That looks better. So TF0. Hey! That actually worked. Okay, so it was the wrong blocking factor on the tape. Uh, that's probably because the, the block size was set for like one of the other PDP operating systems. So we can read the tape. That is, believe it or not, that is a massive milestone on this project. Okay. So that is... That is a victory, and let me just move the camera a little bit. All right. So where do we go from here? I'm thinking we need to now actually do that kernel rebuild, which I'm not looking forward to doing. Let me see what's in that make file, because that is going to tell me how miserable this is going to be. Um... That actually doesn't look as bad as I was expecting it to be. Like, I, the V6 one, you have to do it all by hand, but this looks like it's completely automated. I mean, it's sort of automated. There are components that are not rebuilt by scratch, but I can use this to relink the kernel. So, if that being the case... Uh, I'm guessing RKTM configuration is for if you want to have an RK device. We, so here's how this works. The, the make configuration utility actually generates a C file called, right, there's no C.C here. Um... It, it automatically dynamically creates this file, which handles the mapping of function names to various devices. Like here you can see KL, that's the serial connector. HT is our current hard drive device. Uh, and you can see that the letters here are defined on the left. So here's RP defined here under 11. So, 
if we go to our config and then we go into we want to move to the end of the document uh, we want to append RK And there it is. So, right. I'm getting better at using add, which is a sentence I never really expected to say. But here we are. So, if we want to now do make config r config, and that adds rk as a boot device. Awesome. So now we can now make a new kernel, and that's compiling. And now. Let's copy that to the root. Let's call that RP Unix. And now we need to shut down and reboot. Uh, Q. And hopefully this boots. So uh, RP Unix. Uh, break. HP zero zero P Unix. Hey, look at that. We actually successfully built, uh, successfully relinked the original kernel. And uh, I just need to do a control D. Root. That is a victory. That is legitimately an actual victory. Uh, so now we need to add the RK devices. Uh, do we have a makefile target for that? We do not. So that means we need to do it by hand. Uh, sys conf. Uh, what was the ID assigned to this? I keep trying to do VI. So let's make sure this actually worked. Yeah, so RK was designed ID 9. I, was that the same one that was used in V6? I just want to see if that's actually the same. I feel like it's different, but who knows? Uh, yeah, that is actually different. No, it actually isn't. Um, oh no, that's character device. What was, what was block device? Because block device is a separate table. Uh, block device. Yeah, is zero. You can see RK zero. All right, so now, so since we don't have commands for it, we just got to do it the old-fashioned way. We just got to copy it uh, or type them in by hand. Whew. I mean, can you imagine what this was like to do back in the day? I, I mean, granted, I really, really wish I had, like, an actual teletype so i'm only going to just make device zero because we're just going to be using this for data transfer um make node character nine oh uh scratch that line why is someone blasting music hold on i gotta close the window there are people that like blasting their stereo really early in the morning around here uh and then we get the raw that's not right that's nine zero cool um so now what comes oh i forgot to plug in the camera wow this <laughs> um <laughs> i i shouldn't be laughing at that but that was a little bit too perfect i for completely forgot that the camera needs electricity too i have a cable for it i just gotta figure out where i put it and i have a second battery pack if it needs it cable one of these 
days. See, the problem is I don't stream very often, so I have a problem in one stream, and then I completely forget to do anything about it for the next one. All right, so that's plugged in. Hopefully, it does. It, I'm not going to have to switch the battery. Let's see here. Uh, I do need to adjust the refresh rate. Let's see here. Oh, don't do this to me. This was a pain to get working earlier. I can't believe it lost this setting. All right, I'm gonna need a moment to fix this because that flicker is gonna drive people mad. Uh, you need to be on the TV setting so I can do you see. Okay. And then you need to be... What do I have the refresh rate on the terminal set to? I actually have it set to 100 hertz. And it looks like it's fine now. Let me get out of terminal setup. Yeah, okay, so apparently all I had to do is do is screw up. Let me take this out of setup mode. Uh, which one's the right one? I think it's that one. Yeah, there we go. Problem solved. That was more annoying than it needed to be. <laughs> you know, I have good days, and then I have days where... Um, so I had expected my bike trip to last longer than it did, because I was kind of looking for an answer. You know, I'll t let's take a little break. Um, the bike trip, I made it all the way to Boston. I was continue considering continuing on to Maine, but I actually found the answer to what I was looking for inside, you know, like my own personal answer to things that I was looking for. Cause I talked about that in the season one finale. And at that point I decided I was going to wrap it up. Um, be especially cause the weather was turning against me. Um, so I reached Boston and then I took the train to Rhode Island just to cut a lot of city miles out. I saw some friends in Rhode Island. I biked to the edge of Connecticut and then I took, uh, shoreline East Metro North home. I did about, I think the total mileage was like 350 something miles. I, I know it was 200 and 281 to Boston by the, by the route I took and I put another 60 or so past that. So there. All right. Oh yeah, I should check the autofocus. Uh autofocus. Are you Oh, you're count you're kidding me. Can I not? Thank you for the autofocus because yeah, that actually did get turned back on. All right. So, we now have a disk pack in the drive. So the first thing I want to see, can I, um, can we mount that disc pack? So let me, or can I mount a V6 disc pack? I think that's the question I'm looking for. Uh, so let's go to ancient Unix V7. Go to, uh, let's go to the source test. All right, and then we'll just get RK0 here because I don't really care that much. We're going to erase this pack if it works. So now we need to attach this pack. So attach RK0, RK0. Non-existent parameter. Existing parameter attach RK0 RK01 creating new file. I wonder if the type of I wonder if the hard drive types are mutually exclusive. Oh, that could be a really big problem if that's the case. So here's the way it normally works is the pdp 11 has no concept of um like isa slots it was all handled through memory mapped io 
And I'm a little worried that there's compatibility problems. Let's let's see if we can actually do anything with this. Let's go back to go. Uh, we need to format this. So make format. And I know we did this earlier, but I always get confused with this command syntax. Because it's never what you expect it to be. So dev RK0. And if it's the size and blocks, it should be 5,000. I mean, it did format it, which does tell me that I did something correctly. So let's, can we mount it? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, hold on. Mount. here um no such file directory can't make directory now i mean that's there What? Mount, not found. RP3 on user, that's correct. RK0 is an RK05 disk pack, or it's supposed to be. I mean, anyone who was alive when this came out would be 44 as of today. Pretty much anyone who worked on that would be or a retired. Let me think about this. Hold on. Did we... So that's root, that's swap. TM... TK. Let's see here. RK. Let me make sure the driver names haven't changed in like the intervening years because that is possible. Uh. Let's like look at the first 20 lines of source code. It doesn't actually say what the driver is. That is freaking useful. Um, I probably have to compare the source code side by side. All right, so I'm in root. Let me just try. No such file or directory. Did I not do this correctly? File system. What's the man page? Thing? Maybe I gave it a bad argument. I'm so used to typing on Solaris, I'm hitting caps lock instead of control. All right, so now that that's there, what does it say? Uh, file system prototype, blah, 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 blah. Constructs a file system. Inodes, the mode token, six character string. Wow, that like tells me absolutely nothing useful. Files directory makes the entries.
You know what? Maybe it had to be the raw block device. Is that possible? Okay, that gives me a right error. That formatted. I check says it's happy. No such file directory. Did I? No, that's there. Oh, I see what you're saying. No, I did it. I did it right on the second try. You can see it here. Uh, kill. I don't want. I don't need that. So why can I? I read it. Okay, hold on. Let's zero this out. Zero. And let's just see how many records. Right. There's no. Uh, RP, what is it? RP three, because I just I just want to zero it out or put something on it. I want to see how many records go on it, because that would be the last parameter for make file system. This will error out sooner or later. And when it does, it'll tell me how many it actually did. No, I created mount in the top level directory. And hopefully, uh, oh yeah, so neat trick, you can't control C on this version, it's delete on the keyboard. All right, chat, we're not talking about that, that I apparently screwed that up as badly as I did. I'm hoping I'm getting the size argument right. Uh, but let's just see if we can mount it and then we'll come back to that. Uh, RK0 mount. Okay. We can mount it. That's actually good to know. But I'm not certain I've got the size argument correct. What was... What the size did it use for... V7? Like, didn't that give that, like, the 32-bit... Uh, or 16-bit max integer? Can I run DF on this version? Well, I can run DF, but I think it... It's just going to spin and sit there. Oh, right. You have to recompile DF in this version. Forgot about that. Yeah, if it's a hard-coded list. Uh, they might have fixed it in this one. In V6, I had to write a patch in this nope in this one you actually still have to do that if you want your hard drive to be listed in df you have to add it manually to the source code and recompile oh you got you just gotta love it So the question I'm having right now is, is this the correct format? So RP, let's see here, hold on. Let's just look at basic blocks. So no, 5,000 would actually be correct because it's 512 block size. Yeah, 
Yeah, okay, so that is actually correct. Uh, and we are still mounted, correct? Yes. So, what we want to do now is we want to extract our tape from zero to this directory. Oh, the uh, tape got disconnected when we restarted the uh, emulator. Uh, error on device three. Or actually, the tape probably needs to be rewound. Um, yeah, so if I need to do RTM zero dev null <coughs> or maybe I just need to reattach it <coughs> this was not well documented in the manual okay Here goes nothing. Actually, uh, <coughs> there it goes. It's extracting it. <coughs> so the real question is going to come now is, will we be able to mount this? under a v6 unix system and the uh can't create or expect it that's a known behavior for this um df would be configured by the system administrator when the system was set up for each disk drive um by and large disks while you could unmount and mount by and large they were not exactly hot swap So, all right. Uh, the camera being used is a Canon PowerShot G7X Mark III. Oh, man, this is slow. And a lot of it's probably just the terminal speed, but there is something immensely satisfying watching Tar unwind like this. But now we come to the, assuming this all goes as planned, we still have the hard part. So I do kind of want to test this on, I, I'm thinking I want to make a new or newer system. I haven't decided yet. Like, I'm not sure how much disk space we're going to have free when all is said and done. Because who knows? There is no FS tab, and yeah, um, I'm I'm doing all right. I I just didn't sleep super well last night, and just a few other things, but I'm fine. Well, there's a message you don't want to see every day. Help extract write error. I think it ran out of disk space. Yeah, okay, so that's what happened. Um, that's kind of a problem. I'm a little surprised it's that big. Oh, wow. What is with my console drawing speed? What are you doing? Hold on. Did you, like, lose your baud rate? No. You seem okay. Wow, that is running really laggy. Let me detect. Uh, when in doubt, turn it off and back on.
the newest to oldest I've ever cross compiled. Oh, that's a hard one. I don't actually know offhand. All right, there we go. All right, so we can't extract to an RK01, which means we have to do a different device. I don't know what V6 supports offhand. I, like I said, I do have a test image. Let's let's take a look here and see what is and is not supported. Because that this is going to actually change how some things work if this is how we have to do it. Because. Uh, all oh right, there's no CD in this version. We have to do change directory. Uh, is it sys on this one? That is going to drive me a little bit crazy. Uh, let's see here. Sys. I need to see what drivers we do have. Hey, that time I remembered. It's weird knowing the fact that there is a Unix out there with no... Um, with no CD command. So we've got mboot, RP. Okay, so it looks like RP is a viable choice. <sighs> okay. Um, yeah, well, I've got LP setup on this one. Th this works. I've got screen for what I really need. I feel like run is the compile command. I Yeah, okay, this is actually the compile command. Uh Let's see here. Does this actually build a new kernel or is it just Yeah, it doesn't actually build a new kernel. Uh You know, this is actually documented in the install instructions for V6. I'm going to have to build a new V6 system from scratch. I just need to know what I have to work with. So if I want to relink the V6, it's in user sysconfig. And then we have make config. Okay, so it does support the RP device. So we would just have to build a V6 system with an RP terminal device on it. Let me think about this. The RP terminal device... The RP terminal... <coughs> wow, my lungs. I don't know what it is, but something is really irritating my lungs today. Yeah. Well, this is the Thompson shell, and we're going to have to compile the the Yale shell as an upgrade to this. Which really kind of puts it all in context. Let me, let me, let's, I want, let's look at the install instructions for V6 Unix, because this may or may not be the deciding factor on where we go from here. Uh, that's not what I actually want. Instructions. 
rebuilding the kernel. It initially gets installed to a to an RK0 device. And then we relink in a new kernel. We would have to do a dump and a restore to boot off RP0. That is not trivial. That is really not trivial. Uh, when you say audio cutting out, do you mean entirely or just my voice? Because I can bump the voice up a little higher. No, actually, I can see that. This, I think I'm dropping packets. Yeah, there, there is some connectivity problems. The yellow shell, interestingly enough, I, I noticed this earlier when I was looking at this. Uh, where was it? I think it was in System 1. Yeah, SH. It was written by John uh, Levine. Um, I very briefly actually met him. At, I believe I met him at an ICANN meeting. He's still active, which is impressive. He must have. He must have been an undergrad or just finished his master's when this was done, and he's still at it, which is kind of impressive. Assuming it's the same john uh leven but yeah you can see that this is the yale university shell which is an upgrade over the thompson shell that we're currently using i'm just rolling i'm going to step away for the next minute or two i'm just going to stretch my legs while i think about this because this froze a monkey wrench in my plans but i don't think it's an unsolvable monkey wrench so i'll be right back Okay, so I had a thought about this. So if we go back to the main readme file, it talks about how the build system, yeah, here it is. The source site for this stuff can only afford a single mounted file system for sources, which makes me think that you could do it with a single rp device so let me show you what this rp device is uh it's not this one that would be i don't want bookmark would it be rp uh deck rpo6 yeah here it is columbia university so this is the type of disk drive v7 was using it was this i'm guessing it's like refrigerator size 
Oh, hold on. Am I really still? No, I, I just got some stream latency. Um, and once again, the stream is having problems. Because of course it is. So this is the RPO6 disk drive. Um, it's a 600 pound monster. Um, and you could put multiple disk packs in this. Like this talks about how our deck 20s had approximately four RPO6 drives each. But it looks like for that to work, it looks like there can only be one RPO6 per system. Because if we look at how V7 worked, we attached the one drive in Sim H, and then it had all the packs there. Let's look at the Sim H manual, because the Sim H manual will tell me more about this. And actually, cool, it's right there in the bookmark bar. Um. I mean, we might be able to do this as multiple devices. Yeah, so cartridge disk devices. And then, yeah, because this was connected to the mass bus. Let's see Let's see what we have to work with, and then we'll go from there. Um, God, we are literally looking up hardware that is older than I am. What a world we live in. Yeah, so there's the punch. Uh, imagine if we had to load this in from punch tape. That would, that is a thing that we could do, but uh, not today. All right, line printer, programmable clock, cassette tape, floppy drive, cassette. Um, so we have more cassette units. We could load a RK06 or an RK07. How much disk space does that give us? Like, is that more or less? I'm assuming it would be more, but yeah, I, Dex. Dual cartridge removable. How many sectors does this actually support? Uh, transfer rate. Wow, it supports a full. 13 megabytes. And it was connected via the Unibus. Okay. Okay. Not 128, just 12. I mean, look at the size of those data packs. That's, that's hefty. Like, that's as big as a frying pan and probably weighs three times like is there 325 pounds can you imagine 325 pounds of just for the disk drive all right so let's look at this so here's the rk05 disk i don't think there's anything that's Stopping us from using an RKO6. When were these released? Do they say? Uh, 1976. I mean, it is the right time period. I just don't know if it would work. There. Were, I mean, that was a problem I wasn't expecting. Let me just go. Let's go down to where it was had the mass bus. Okay, disk pack drives. You can set the type here. I guess we just. You know, we could just. You know, that would actually just work. I could just create a separate RP unit and I could just mount both of them. Why? Why am I not doing that? Like, uh. Yeah, I'm thinking that sounds like the actually sane solution. So let's get out of V6, because that's not going to actually help us for the moment. I really hope U-mount exists on this system. Please? Yes, it does. Uh, block device. Okay, cool. That is unmounted. 
Uh, so if I want a stop simulation, I want to set RP1. Non-existent parameter. So if I want to add another drive, or that would be attach. Override last track, yes, that's fine. So that creates a new disk pack. Okay, so we don't have a file for this one. So for RPO3, OPR4, RPL6, HT, that's the tape unit. RPO3, 4, 5. Why is it moving a little bit left like that? That is weird that it's doing that shouldn't uh rp0 rp3 the terminal being all screwy why why is it doing that Control E, let me look at my config file again. So this is how we have it set up right now. Attention RP, so it sets the type to RP06. RP06 makes a cylinder and that's it. I'll be back in a moment. If anyone has any ideas, please put them in chat. I'll be gone for a, about a minute. So here's what I'm thinking. I think we got to look at the Unix source code to understand what was actually supported and how to attach it. By and large, Unix installations were customized per site and there's no real general documentation on how to do any of this. So we have magnetic tape, we have fixed hard drives. Because I need to be able to, or I need to be able to backport TAR to V6. I actually did find someone who did it, 
but I have to do a lot of system patching because tar actually demands it depends on sys calls that don't exist in v6 unix uh which really makes things exciting for all the wrong reasons let's see here so drive capacity okay, so this is magnetic tape fixed head hard drives And then you have just a couple of disk controllers. Most of these are too new for what would be supported. Yeah, we've got deck tape and more. We've let's take a look at the source code that we do have. I mean, I could dig up the actual V6, but for what we're doing, this should not matter. Uh, if I go to DMR, is it in there? Yes, it is. So RP disk driver. Talks about, so this is the partition table, which was all hard coded. How does it figure out which drive it is using? Because that would actually be defined. It's usually defined as a byte number and an address. Because here's the RP address space in memory. And I should note this is octal numbers you know since so that's a leading zero you know just to make it that extra bit of suffering because a lot of pdp stuff was 36 bit um and it's just the the pain and suffering is real like if we look at the rk driver which should be in here and it's not Oh, here it is. Okay. Yeah, so here's the disk driver here. And you can see that it's calculated off the minor. So if we go up to RP address, please tell me it's here. Please tell me it's here. Because without this... That presents a problem. The traditional way this would be solved, I'm thinking you can't hook up multiple RP disks in a single system. Which makes sense, unfortunately. I mean, how many places would really have more than one of those disk packs? So the question now becomes, if we use one of the bigger RX desks, would it work? There was a lot of reasons why I got off Unit Linux entirely. The fact of the matter is that the release of GTK4 and especially Ubuntu 2204, although I saw this in Fedora, is that no one cares anymore. It is so fundamentally broken in the core libraries that it's not worth the time because it's not getting better. It's been getting progressively worse. I've ranted about this before. I don't really want to rant about it on this stream. Yeah, I think we're going to have to try and see if we can use... Let me figure out which RX disk would work. So, that's labeled as HK. Do we have an HK driver? I thought I saw one, but I don't want to hold my breath. Like, it, like, none of these talk about the type of drives they support. Like, 
we have partition table, paper punch card reader, PTY. What is the RF disc? Cartridge, RL. I'm wondering if the best way to do this is install V6 to the larger capacity hard drive and then try and get the tar command working. I mean, we have the patches for it. I don't really like doing that because I'm so far throwing out the manual, it's not even funny. But that might not be the worst way to do it. I am thinking that might actually be the way to do this. And let me switch the music up because this is annoying me. All right. Okay, so let me run a poll because let me let me split this. Do we want to try and do Unix v6 on an RP drive or v7 on an RK drive? Because if I can do either one of these, we'll get somewhere. But I probably have to uh, fiddle quite hard to get it. Because I'd have to install v6 as a fresh install. We would have to compile an RL capable system dump restore it I wonder if we could just do a dump restore onto the RK I mean there's no reason why there's no reason why you could not do that at least for a minimal system how many sectors are in use Do I not, did I kill all my sessions? I guess I killed all my sessions. Uh, that's a lot of disk free space. How much, how much is actually in use? Disk usage, two and a half megabytes, I mean, Maybe it's gonna be a really tight fit. Wow, you are basically split down the middle. Chat is okay. I think going with v6 and trying to compile the tar for v6 is the way to go here uh, after because i did find this improving v6 unix and this was done recently like this is only from the last few years because if we look on this page yeah the v7 tar is not hard to get working I could copy and paste the source code in. Be kind of annoying, but you can do it. Um, let's see here. Source code is here. We'd also have to add in these header files. Again, that's not hard. Annoying, but it's not actually hard. All right, so I think with the process we have to do, um, let me let me write this out because I I need to I need to actually plan this out. This is not going to be trivial. Uh, so the V six installation media. 
only supports copying to and from block device. Like if we go to not the sim h install instructions, we need the actual original install instructions. The ones that came from AT&T. Uh, actually, there is an RP. Let's see here, there is an actually an RP boot pack right there. Standalone program con considering the tape bootstrap on 0 0.1 TP format. So on V6, there is a bootstrap program for an RP04 device. Because RX05, um, RK05 is too small. V7 can be booted from distribution tape, which we already knew. Um, yeah, okay, here it is. The original manual. So let's read let's read what the original manual has to say about this, because this is the closest thing I'm gonna find to this. So this is the different tapes. So this is doing the manual booting for an RPO3. Can we use the emulate an RPO3 and does that have enough disk space? Okay, so here's all the supported disks. The Unix system is running to configure to run on an 1144 with a given disk, uh, a magnet tape, and a deck tape. And then this file is a set of shell commands that will rebuild in free configurations for RX, RP, and HP. So what is the HP device? Because HP is what this is using. Because if we scroll up, it does it tell us anything useful? God. <laughs> HP is an RPO4, which is what we're already using. RPO4. Successor to large player devices, blah, 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 blah. How big was it? 88 megabytes. Neat. Okay. So if we go back to the install instructions, the problem with the RP04 is that to be added, <laughs> there's a bit missing here. Which, you know, is a slight problem. This is the part where I tell you that you needed an actual install wizard to do this. If we can get away with an RP03, that might be ideal. Um, what was the RP03? Multiplier large drive. How big were these? 41 megabytes. And then we could try and build and patch in the uh, patch in tar. I mean, that seems to make sense. Like, what are we currently configuring this with? Because I feel like I'm going around in circles but I'm not CERN. Uh, control H. Is simulating an RP06. Okay. Okay, we can we can work with this. So RP06, because I, I, the biggest problem is I really don't want to try and do more uh but this also says that rpo6 was supported with maximum eight drives controller did you not make this easy 
setting up Unix. Okay, so here's Handle's reconfiguration. So this is what we have to work with. We have an RPO3 and RPO4. Um, it's not entirely impossible that we could rebuild the tape, but I have no good sense of instructions on how you do that. This talks about making all the special files. This is the source disk with all the commands. Time conversion, disk layout. That talks about creating new users. File system health and odds and ends. As written by Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie. Oh, well, and for those who are wondering about the East Coast, I mean, it's right there. Um, in the original context, what would generally happen is you would contact AT&T or another site. You would tell them their hardware and they would build a distribution tape for you. And that's how it was done. Like there was, and the problem is that the knowledge to like build a new distribution tape is lost. Like there are no instructions on how to do it. Uh, some places would go of a tape um, and do it like for instance there was a very entry model version of the PDP 1123 that you would have to build a special install tape for and there's no known copies of it and Diet Coke helps some let's go back to looking at the install instructions See, this is where you run into real problems with the old stuff. Like, there are instructions to getting Unix running. Actually reconfiguring Unix. Completely different ballgame. Um, so, if we look at what's on the tape. Copy the mag tape assumes RK05. What I think I'm going to have to do is we're going to have to build a RKO5 system. I'd rather do it from scratch than the one I was using just because I don't remember what I did to that one. We would have to add an RP uh, booting Unix obtained programs, bulk ROM for disks, execute blocks. RK Unix. I'm thinking going with the RK03 is probably simpler. Let's keep reading for the instructions because I know what it's supposed to look like, but um, if you have the tape, generates the. Unless you only have a single RK drive. Okay, because this talks about the co tape copying and setup. This is say, uh, assumes RKO5 C number six. If you have an RP03 TMRP and use 99 instead of 100. If you have an RP04, by generating the disk pack. But then where do you get the user partition for them? Um, because if you look at the SimH install instructions, actually I got another way we can get those, so that's not actually a big deal. Because you wouldn't normally install Large multi platter, large disk drive predecessor. Like, was this a single drive or was it a partition drive? Which I don't know. Let it, you know, let's screw it. Let's, let's go for broke. Um, let's try and install to an RP03 machine. Let's. So let me grab the install instructions because this is still going to be a handy reference, even though we're not going to actually use it for anything. Um, 
And I'm actually going to bring up a terminal here. So one of the neat things about screen is I can run it in multiple places at once. Yeah, screw it. I'll actually key these things by hand. Because I'm going to have to do a lot of things by Bane. This is going to be a lot of pain. So we need to do the tape boot. So there's the camera. So let, let's make a new V6 RP03. And then let's make a tape boot file. So first we just need to set the CPU and we need to set the tape unit. And then attach RP zero, P zero. And then we actually need to change the type which was documented in the manual. So we need to make this an RP of, uh, yeah, so we need to set RP zero, RP, uh, supports the boot command. There's no RP3 listed here. Start display. Dispack drives. This is really not supported like cartridge. Like if I grep this, it is not supported. Because of course it's not supported. Why would why would this be supported? Oh, that that's the sound of something dying. Okay, that's why it's what? So the RPO3 according to this was not supported on the PDP11, but the manual says it is. Why does this have to be? Why does it have to say that this is to be added? Uh, correspond to the deck boot ROMs execute block at block zero. So normally, when you start up v6 for the first time, you actually have to key in a program on the front console. That's what you do right here. Um, the question is the program that they're running in that documentation. Okay. Making a tape disk from tape. Uh, key in boot. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This actually may not be as bad as it seems. Okay, okay. So it looks like this manual key-in procedure is used if you don't install a boot sector. Because if we go further down, and I, I actually know this from installing this from hand. Um, if I go further down, rebuild the multi-user, RK0. It's listed here. I just have to find it. Tape offset, count one, disk offset. Yeah, so right here is where the boot sector is installed. Disk offset zero, tape offset 100. And if we look at the original install manual, because we just read that, the boot sector, uh, the boot sector is in location 100. If I RF to it. Here it is. Yeah. So if you have an RP, have you an RP04 disk, use TMHP or THHP and use 98 instead of 100. That's how you do it. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, that is painful. That is painful. Because if we can actually get V6 to start, it is possible to start V7 directly off the tape. Um, V7, like right here. How do I get this to run? Because if we look at the V7 instructions, it actually boots directly off the tape device. Which means we could start from the V7 tape. And we should be able to do a restore off it. Like, there's no reason why we, why that shouldn't work. Like, I can't think of a reason why that wouldn't work. I could be completely wrong about this, but I think that would actually work. So let's, let's actually key in the install program. Uh, for, so I do want to actually show this. So PDP 11 front panel. What I'm going to be doing next is if we take a look at not that photo. And wow, my internet is like broken. Let's see here. PDP. Nope, that ain't it. Why is... There we go. Um, and I'm on the wrong terminal. Yeah. So if you look at this, this is the front panel for a PDP 11. When you try and do start Unix V6, you'd physically have to key in opcodes with this and load in the program to make it jump. Uh, so that, that is, it, that is what we are actually doing. Obviously we're doing this in a digital fashion. And not, you know, a analog fashion, but it works because here's the program we have to type in um, right there. And you can also see it's right there in the uh, setup. So we need to uh, install and execute this. Yeah, I'll leave the webcam on for now. All right, so attach, and then we will key CPU memory address 100,000, 12700. These are, like I said, this is a very minimal program to load blocks from a tape and dump it into memory. Uh, I have seen a disassembly of this program. It, like I said, it's almost nothing. Um, oh yeah, I have backspace. I should use it. 10040. Six. O one two seven four zero. CPU. Uh, o six o o o three. DCPU. And then go a uh, hundred thousand. All right. So now we just need to copy in the install tape. Mix V6, V6. I am probably the first one to try and do this from the original documentation in 30 years. So that's going to create the new disk pack and then it will hang. And now I need to force reset to zero. There we go. Okay. So that equal prompt means I'm in the standalone tape installer environment. So according to the, so now we need to go back to the instructions. We need to copy the mag tape to disk. Um, Okay, so the program we need is 
TMHP disk offset um let's see here disk offset tape offset yeah all the formatting here is like a little bit screwy because the way the the setup guide like the modern setup guide does this as two separate commands so it does zero tape 100 count one I want to do for the RP04 98 and one. So, so I want to write block zero, 98, and I want to write one block. Okay, cool. That is the root bootstrap program. All right, so now how do I install the rest of the system? Because I'm not completely sure. Uh, okay. The source disk may be generated on RPO3 pack generates the binary disk. The source disk may be generated on another RP pack by using tape offset 4101 instead of 101. Uh, 101 is what's, yeah, 101 is what's used there. Oh, the source disk is what generates the uh, source file system. So how do we install the rest of it? The tape should move. So I think I just need to do tape offset 101 and we do the rest. So let's just try that. I'm not convinced it's going to work, but we'll try it. 101 uh oh no that that ain't right no 101 that's right 3999 count i screwed that up uh ah frig something locked yeah okay hold on go zero Okay, yeah, it's stuck in a loop. Um, quit. When in doubt, let's try that again. Okay, so HP. Um, no, okay, hold on. Uh, TMHP disk offset would be one. Tape offset is 101, count 3999. And now we wait. So now that's copying the blocks from the tape to the um, to the RP04 disk pack. So now we need to bring the system up in single user mode. And I just realized the camera was pointing at the wrong thing. Uh, let me just point this out. So here we started from block zero. We ran the tape to a TPHP, which is what it, HP is what the device is called. Disk offset one, tape offset is the blocks. Blocks are 512, uh, 512 bytes. And then we just copied all the uh, blocks apart. And now we're back at the prompt. So now, Let's all right, so we don't need this program anymore, but what we do need is we do need to set the system to start up in single user mode. This is normally done with a physical switch. I have no, I literally have no idea if this is going to work. Uh, let's go. Um, did I load the wrong one? Why did I get this?
boot rp0 Okay, I think I copied the wrong thing the first time around. Let's try that a second time. I think probably just because of all the issues we had, something probably went wrong. So go zero, tape to HP, disk offset zero, Disk offset one one oh one three nine nine nine. Hopefully, this time it works. Yes. Okay, that is a really good sign. So see that the prompt is now an at sign? I should be able to type HP. <laughs> yes! We're booted, we're booted from the RPO4. <laughs> I did it. I actually did it. Yes! Oh, wow. Reading 50-year-old install instructions to actually pull that one off. That's a new one in my book. <laughs> yes nice okay uh i think this is a good time for the shameless plug if you're enjoying this content please like and subscribe if you really enjoy this content consider supporting the channel with the links in the description i have a coffee i have a patreon i forgot to put the coffee please support me link in the stream but i got it working uh, well, I, I don't have it working, but we successfully managed to boot from an RPO4 hard drive, which to my knowledge has never been documented at all. We still need to install the rest of the system, but that is a victory. That is a legitimate, legitimate victory. Oh, that makes me so happy. Okay. Let me find some better music to listen to. I really should have remembered to put the coffee please support me link in the channel because it really does make a huge difference. But uh, all right, let's figure out how we do what we have to do next because this ma the install sh uh, sim h manual to go to desktop. The rest of it from this point forward is basically not going to help us. There are some things in here which is sort of useful, but not really. So let's look at what we have here. We need to reconfigure the running kernel to have all the hardware we actually need. Um, and then we'll have to make the boot blocks for it. Getting And then we're going to have to figure out how we're going to get the source disk out. That one I have a couple of ideas on how we're going to tackle that particular nightmare. But one thing at a time. Uh, Uname does not exist on this version of Unix. Uh, hold on. SETI L case. Yeah. Uname does not exist on this version. Just for those who are wondering. And thus we literally cannot even port NeoFetch to this if we wanted to. Um... Time conversion, disk layout. If I type, I don't think DF actually will work. I mean, it could, but I don't think it actually will. Um, let's finish the rest of the setup. So if we continue with the install instructions, we have to relink the kernel. So let's do that. So user sys conf. We need to compile the make config command. And there's no dash O on this one. So I have to compile it and then I have to actually rename it like that. 
Um, so I believe we need to do HP because that's going to be the boot device. I do want an RK device, a tape, a punch console, line printer, and done. Cool. So now uh, I don't have buy. Um, so we look at c.c. Okay, so we can see, let's make sure that the HP device is built in and we can see that it's block device zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven and it's zero. Oh, actually, I think did I? I think I counted for the wrong one. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's block device six. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So block device six, character device fourteen. Cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, I turned the music off for a bit. I I just needed it off for my own sanity. And root device is looks like that's configured correctly because root device six. Yeah, that would actually be correct. There's no end curses. There, there is no... Oh, the, the, having a terminal at all is not something that actually existed back in the day. We would be doing this on a teletype. <clears throat> a teletype if we were doing this correctly. If someone wants to donate a teletype to the channel, I will redo this with an actual teletype if I can get enough adapters. Please let it be an ASCII teletype. I don't really want to deal with 5-bit but aren't uh, teletypes. Please know and thank you. All right. So now that we've got the basics for the kernel, we need to actually build the dang thing. So that part isn't hard. We need to build M40S. We need to rename it as M40O. C-O... Uh, and then we can now link a new kernel. O C dot O lib one lib two. Oh, I typed the wrong command before. Okay. Cannot open. Oh, okay, there we go. All right, so how big is our kernel? 31 kilobytes, which is exactly what it should be. Uh, so let's move that. Okay, cool. So now we need to build the device nodes. All right, so let me, I'm just gonna put the basic RK0 device in. Uh, I don't really want to do all of them. And then I guess it would be dev HP0 block. And then I said it was eight zero and 16 zero uh we'll check that in a moment not that it really matters 
Okay, so that, now we need the other really important ones. We need the uh, the tape device and the tap device. So uh, make node MT0, that's the tape. I'm sorry if I'm not talking much. I just, I have to just type. There's no way around it. I really just have to type most of these out. Uh, okay, let's get the printer. Uh, and then we just need to do all the turn. We need to. We don't technically need these, but we should probably have them because things will get unhappy if I don't. Uh, dev tty zero three zero. I will say having a model M to type on is really nice if a bit loud. And I gotta tell you, once you get used to it, using the hash sign and the at sign to cancel out a line isn't that bad. Five. You really do appreciate the fact they included a make file for this in v7 unix make node dev tty six c nope 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 cancel that line well, actually there is no eight so Strike that line. Okay. All right, cool. So that handles all the major block stuff. Let me look at the rest of the install instructions. Uh, we don't need to extract the source as of right now, and I kind of don't want to. We're going to need it, but we're not going to need it yet. We should be able to actually uh, I actually, I do need to, we do need to make one modification. We have to recompile. Like I said earlier, uh, user source S1. Oh, that's right. I don't have the source installed. I have no easy way to extract the source because it's not in a format that I can easily, can easily get to. I would have to, how am I going to get the source on this system? That. That's an interesting question. I am probably going to have to write the source code. I know how I know how we're going to do it. Watch this. So we do control E attach. Uh, we'll just extract it to an RK device and then we can move it as we need to uh, attach rk0 rk0 user disk okay that's fine uh, and now we just need to and now we can f copy it so if we do dd I mean, and it makes sense for the source code to be on a removable disk. Because it wasn't something that you'd really need to have online all the time. And it was valuable. Oh, there's probably no RK, um, <clears throat> RK support in this kernel. Uh, that really just means we just need to reboot. So if I did this correctly, we should actually be able to boot off the hard drive. 
I'm not completely holding my breath about that, but we'll see. Like, is that... That may be all I need. <laughs> and that is a multi-user boot. Nice. Cool. So attach RK0. Uh, what did I call the file? Why is that complaining? Um, attach RK0 non-existent parameter set RK0 RK05 Why are you having a fit about that? You know what, screw it, that, that's fine. If I try that again, what happens? Yeah, see, then I get that non-existent parameter thing. Oh, but probably because it hasn't been formatted. It's probably doing something quote unquote un intelligent. All right, so let me, can we successfully load the source code from a tape? Well, it didn't error out trying to do it. So this is a good sign. I don't know how long, I don't remember how long this took. Hopefully it's not like stuck. Okay, records in and out, so. I mean, the file system says it's good, so... Nice! Okay, so now we have the source code restored. Does, does CP in this version... I, I'm probably tempting fate by asking this question, but does this support dash R? Because that would make my life very easy if it does. Of course it doesn't. Why would that be? <laughs> why would it support something useful like recursive copying? Oh, I could probably, I believe I can move the directory. I just really don't want to. I really don't want to. Uh... All right, let's let's fix let's fix the df command because that's actually something I care about. Uh, change drs one. What is currently mounted? Yeah, it doesn't even have HP zero mounted. Um, so I need to do ed df. What line is it on? I want to do RP zero D and I want to list. Uh, Frig, what was it? Was it? Is it like if I want to do the next forty lines? Yeah, that's how you do the next forty lines. Uh, let's go to the top of the file. Twenty list. Ah, uh, right. I never remember the commands when you need it. Oh, it's right there at the top. See where it says RK two. I just need to change that. Is that four? Yeah. So change 
for tab. And then I want to append. Actually, I don't want to append. Abort. One, two, three, four, five, delete five. And actually delete five again. Okay, that's correct. Right. Did I put the wrong block device when I did this originally? I might have. Oh, one of these days I can type. Sys. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. And what did I set that block device to? Oh, uh, shoot, I gotta clear the terminal. I set it to eight, okay. That, that explains why that doesn't work. Make node, ec make node block. Dev HP zero block six zero. Okay, DF It's a challenge, I gotta be honest. Like you think, oh, it's gonna be a Unix system. It's like how different could it actually be? And it it is okay so there we go we've got that's the free number of blocks we have it successfully reading the disk uh so we've got 993 blocks available uh do i have bc i do actually have bc uh I don't think I did that math correctly, but I we, we've got disk space. Yeah, we've got disk space. Um, can I just quit? Yeah, I can just quit. Let's, just because I want to have a better idea of what I'm actually doing, uh, I want to append on line four. Yeah, that's fine. So right. That doesn't look right to me. Oh, I know why it's not right. Oh, that's that's really a problem that's actually a really big problem that's a really annoying stupid problem that's gonna suck to fix <sighs> yeah that's that's actually like a non-trivial problem to fix all right so he, here's what happened Because we the initial copy from the distribution tape was an MKFS or what was a block for block copy, it wasn't MKFS. It wrote the free structure for a much smaller disk than what I was actually using. Which means that we're not taking advantage of the additional disk space that's there. 
I should have seen that problem coming a mile away. I didn't. Um, let's look at the install manual. Let's see if there's anything useful insights on this because it there's something here that should tell me about this. Um, MKFS. More file systems are created than just the root and putting its file. Let's see here. The arcade disk as distributed. Create intermediary files. New file system. Best way to move a file system is to dump it. Yeah, to mag tape, create a new file system, and then boot it. Yeah, that's kind of what I expected that answer to be. We need to do an archive of the system in its current configuration. Boot off a different disk pack. Format. Um, do a dump and then do a restore. And then after we do that, we'll have the disk space to, you know, actually do what we need to do. The rabbit hole goes kind of deep on this one. Yeah, because, and I actually knew that. Once you have the best, uh, best way to move a file system is to dump it to mag tape and do so. And that would have been the correct way to do it back in the day. Because, let's see here, Superblock has a word, highest address that can be allocated. Uh, wow. Sometimes a file system has to be increased in logical size without copying. The super block of the device has a word giving the highest address that could be allocated. <laughs> so yeah, so the way you used to do this, and I don't think I, I have the command knowledge to do this, is you would have to hex edit the install system and change it. And that was how you did it. Um, let's see here yeah and here's where it is the file system is distributed on tape the tape and source 4000 blocks integrate the layer 2 into a large file system is to extract the tape of a non-overlapping file structure blah 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 uh, new users multiple users file system health Here. Is there like anything here that tells me how to do the resize or am I really going to have to build another system to be able to use this system? I think I'm going to have to build another system to use this system because of course, why, why should I expect anything different? Why? It could be worse. That is that is where I'm... Um, uh, we have the dump command. It's the only real archive thing I have. Which I guess we should make a dump of the system as it is in its current configuration. We're going to need it. Uh, so let me unmount this disk pack. Uh, act unmount... Actually, before I do that, I do actually like this DF command, so we're going to install it. Uh, a out bin DF. Yeah, okay, cool, that works. Uh, so let's change directory to root. Let's unmount RK0. Uh, and now we need to attach so we want to set right enabled. Okay, so attach. Set TM0 right enabled. All right, so now we should be able to just dump the whole thing with a single command. There it goes. 
we are dumping the whole system to tape and there it is it, th there's not a lot to dump here it's not exactly a big system um all right so let's shut down how do i want to do this so before we shut down there's there's stuff we can use so when i I made the earlier image when I was testing this earlier, and that's about to come really, really useful. Uh, so test RP0, RP0 install, because I can boot off this image with the disk that we're already using. So let's attach RK0, RP0 install, non-existent parameter. Why does it keep doing that non-existent parameter? I don't get that. PDP 11 boot that in. Oh, that's actually not what I wanted to do, but can't set drive parameter. Oh, because it needs to be RK, not RP, because I can't read. And then attach RP0, what do they call it? RP0 disk. Like that. Actually, no. Before we do that, we now need to update the Unix kernel on the disk pack. Uh, that, that goes the other way around. So, okay, so here's what I'm doing. So we're basically making a boot floppy for an ancient Unix system. Um, because, of course, that isn't going to flipping work. Okay, what is... Um, quit. Uh, attach RK0. I guess... Do you just like need to be called? Like, do you just need to be called RK0? I mean, it's possible. I don't know why I'm getting those weird warnings. And fo if folks have, are lost, please let me know. This stream is a lot of, this is a very technical and somewhat dry stream. It reads that in non-existent parameter. Let me see here. TM40 set TTO zero, that shouldn't matter. Tape drive is locked. Attach RK0, RK0 should be all fine. Oh, sorry, I'm not on the right terminal. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just I just noticed that. All right, so what am I doing wrong here? So every uh, since I you weren't able to see it before when I try and boot off this I get this warning non-existent parameter RP five which one which PDP yeah I'm using the right one if I just 
just to make sure I'm not losing my mind. PDP 11 boot dot in. Do you actually load? No, you actually have a fit about this. So, okay. But then you still boot? You know, I'm not going to question it. Maybe maybe that's not actually a fatal warning. And I should really rename this folder because it's not accurate. But let's see here. So, and let me get the webcam back just so you can see, see me suffering in real time. All right. So if this is actually mounted, which I have my doubts. Uh, what? Oh, I guess there is an Aurea mount folder. Um, mount uh, okay i guess the disk image is actually there so rm unix okay cool all right so this disk pack ecu mount mount Well, if I did it correctly, we should now be able to boot off the disk pack and then reformat. I'm going to make a backup of this disk because I'll be very um, install one disk. I'll be really unhappy if that is a problem. Boot Unix. I, I didn't actually need the boot. Uh, what device did I boot off of? Uh, that was not the right device. Boot RK0, that is correct. Oh, right, because the root device is hard-coded on these versions of Unix. That doesn't actually help me. Oh, I got to build a special kernel for this. I really don't want to do that, but there's no way around it. <laughs> Why? All right, so here's the problem. Uh, there's no way to dynamic. The, the boot command has absolutely no... Um, no connection to what we actually boot from. Um, I'm going to have to reconfigure the boot kernel. Because I need to start from the R um, RK device, but I still need to have the HP driver in it. Uh, this is my brain melting. You know, and, you know, the worst part is this isn't even the hard part. When I do a future stream on MIT incompatible time sharing system, I'm pretty sure I'm going to go mad in the process. I don't think there's, a, like, a second world where that doesn't happen. All right. So if I want to do – so this needs to be RKHP TM TC 8DC LP done. And now we can – Relink this. Um, let's see here. Uh, ASL dot S. All right. 
so that gives me a new Unix kernel. Yeah, okay, so that gives me a working Unix kernel. And if I check C.C, what is it listed to root device as? Yeah, okay, so root device is zero, zero. So now, Can I just do this? Like, does that actually work? Well, it started and then it looks like it crashed. Which means I may have built that kernel wrong. Why is it not booting from this? I mean, it's possible something's wrong with the... What is going on here? Alright. Did I make a kernel that does not boot? Is that let, let's figure that one out first. So conf a out. Let's make a test Unix right here. Okay, so it does actually have booting problems. So the question is, why do we have booting problems? We have Unix, we have RX Unix. Let's see if we can just boot from the disk pack period, like not actually do anything else. And we can, which tells me I screwed up somewhere. I just don't know where. You know, I should be able to build a new kernel with just what's here. Yeah, actually I can. So we need RX, we need HP, TM, TC, 8DC, LP, and done. We need to link the boot code for the type 40, uh, scratch that, M40S. Okay, hold on. Wrong character device. Okay, hold on, hold on. I have the wrong RP0 character device. That should not matter. Yeah, okay, hold on. Okay, hold on. All right, there's no HP zero device. It shouldn't matter because that's not what we're trying to boot from. We need the device to be there, but we don't actually need it. We don't need it to be there to boot because this this needs to boot from root device zero. Yeah, I think if I just relink this m40.s. Okay. 
Okay, so that's going to relink. And then that's going to be our test. And then it hangs. Why is it hanging? Unless they're incompatible with each other? Is that possible? It's having lag issues because the stream has been iffy. I gotta think about this. I don't, I, I, I need to, I'm gonna go AFK for a minute or two. I'm gonna run an ad. If, folks, please brainstorm while the, the stream catches up. If you do a hard refresh or play at 2x speed, it helps with the delay. Okay, I'm back. The funny thing is, Jacob Davis, I built FTL. Like, I literally um, was the person that built and designed FTL from next door. Okay, so... <sighs> You know, this may be a really stupid idea. I can't, I don't think this would work, but if I just attached a second RP drive, like this didn't work earlier, but maybe it will work now. So if I attach RP1, RP1 disc like that, um, and then boot, PDP boot in. Oh wow, that has an entire that. Oh right, because that, that's not PDP one. Uh, boot dot in. Yeah, override the last track. Okay, so that works. So dev. So let's make an HP one. Like, will that? So that would be. Make no uh, block 
HP one. Like there's no way this is how it was done back in the day, but I also don't know if I care that much. Six one. And the parameter for doing this was in the other document. When you can see here, MKFS restore. Because the seventh edition works quite a bit differently with its install process. Hence why we're like so deep in unsupported territory. I mean, we could try and build this on seven, but I really don't want to try. So three, two, two, seven, eight. Well, it did format. Like, did that actually work? I mean, that looks like that actually worked, which I'm skeptical of, but I don't know if I want to question it. So let's try restoring that backup we made. Uh, what was the name of that tape? Okay, so attach TM0 dump tape all right so restore tfv dev rmt0 all right let's let's see if we can actually restore the tape okay i guess we can restore the tape uh sync 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 this feels like this is a too stupid solution for it to, for it to actually work but because the way you normally have to do from what i vaguely that did not the boot sector I forgot to write the boot sector. <laughs> yeah, uh, the boot sector would not be on this one. We'd have to we have to reinitialize the boot sector. Uh, attach TM zero Unix v six tap. Uh, we actually need to. How do we do this? Uh, let's move RP zero disk. RP zero old rp1 disk rp0 disk do i have that correct here yes i do tdp1 tboot in because this will get me back let's see here go zero All right uh, and then we need tape to hp again disk offset is zero It's probably a bad sign I'm starting to memorize these. Uh. Come on, come on, boot. There's the app prompt. Uh, HP Unix and failure, sort of. So why did that not work? Attach RK zero. Attach RP zero there boot rp0 
So that that is an interesting question. Why did that not actually work? There's the... Uh, RP0 old, root RP0, and that works. So is there something wrong with the RP zero disk I created. That was not what I wanted to do. RP0, RP0. All right, so that works. And that also works. Let's run the I check command. I check is fine. D check. I mean, it is entirely possible that Unix can't boot from a large drive like that. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Or did I copy the wrong boot record? Hold on. DDIF HP0 dev HP1 count1. Okay, so that should copy the boot record. Just, just to humor me. Attach RP0 and then it just gets confused. So why can it boot from one and not the other? Like, am I going to really have to get the hex editor out for this one? I might actually have to get the hex editor out for this one. Let's, let's look at the install manual one more time because obviously I am missing something. I mean, granted, I might be able to make this work. There are ways I could make this work. It's just not ideal. Let's look at the desktop. I'm not quite ready to start hacking up this install something worse. So reconfiguration... HP device is an RP04. Console typewriter. Um, floating point assembly file. Let's see here. Run eight drives, should not be changed. Uh, the big disk drives, RP0 and HP0. Ah, okay, so there is actually partitioning here. That, that might actually explain part of the problem. If there is a partition map, set up that may be the problem let's look at the driver source code maybe that's and you know that makes sense because i remember when i looked at the v7 sources that was in fact a thing so this talks about rp sizes one two three four five six 
seven, eight. Which I think is the cylinder partitions for each RP device. Let me see how this is referenced. So if this is the partition table right here, RP sizes. Actually, wrong driver. I need to look at HP. Yeah, so here's the if this is actually a partitioned device and it is look 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 bp equals b dev d minor okay that's how it works uh let me write a note out because this is gonna make sense so unlike the rx drives this is basically like so rp0 is the what is it the first the first 23 cylinders uh rp1 is that what's the second i guess it's the start and then the size? Is that in blocks or is that in something else? Like, if you really wanted to change the partitioning on your Unix system, you'd have to recompile your kernel. So, cylinder in. Tested on a working RP. There's something you really... Um, are going to feel confidence. This driver has been tested on a working RPO4 for a few hours, and that's what they shipped. Is cylinder equivalent to a sector in this version of Unix? That I'm not sure. Uh, it is available online. I'm looking at the v6 unix source or actually i'm looking at the network unix source uh i did upload it to github earlier i'll drop the link in the chat okay all right so let me so it looks like we are going to need to change oh this would be really nice if this was documented uh, for folks who are interested, there is a wiki that I set up for the Discord. Uh, and yes, we do have a Discord. Um, I would consider it a personal favor if like folks would help document some of this. So there looks like there's a hard-coded partition table. I don't know if there's a concept of a sector. Yeah, here it is. Track sector cylinder. If we look at, because we had a lot of technical difficult information on these, I just want to try and figure out what we're working with. So if we have a RPO4 drive, how much data do we have? Sectors per track is 22. So sectors per track is 22. And if they're smart, which I assume they are, they would align it yeah that's exactly what i expect to see so 22 sectors per track uh let's do a little math here so 22 times 512 because we actually do need to know what the format commands are going to look like how do i not have bc installed on this system okay uh BC. So 22 times 512 comes out to 11 megabytes on the root partition. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so then the second partition becomes. Let's let's look at this. Because once we know these are correct, then we can dump and restore this properly. Um, install so so 
So partition 24 through 43 is left open. So that's 0, 1, 2, 3. And then cylinders 358 through 407. I wonder why they leave two tracks open. That might be a, like a deck specific thing. So that'd be what, what, 20 megabytes, give or take? Uh, let's see here. 407 minus 358. That's 49 cylinders. Which comes out. I mean, is my math looking right here? I mean, there's probably like a technical reason why they would do this. And that would work out to an available storage of approximately 30, what? 33 megabytes, give or take. The RPO4 drive was what? 88 megabytes. But it might depend on the pack that was in the drive. Actually, no, hold on. That actually makes sense. And here's the reason why it makes sense. You could split the pack between multiple operating systems by changing the sectors in use. Like, if you want to run RT11 and share the disk with Unix, you would manually modify this. Yeah, so it's it's complete freaking magic. Um, I actually did encounter this once before when I was playing with an x86 port of V7 Unix, which is why I even fought the check. So yeah, so... Let me think about this. So I, it looks like if we want to do the install, and I, like do the install properly, so proper proper unix v6 install uh do rx based installation first make make fs the rpo4 disks um dump restore okay so then RP0 makefs root, RP3 makefs user need to install boot block, dump restore root user boot from HP device. Why is it called? If someone in chat can figure out why the device driver is called HP, I'd really like to know. I mean, you know, the difference between this and blood magic is I'm only stabbing myself occasionally. And if anyone gets that reference, I salute you. I mean, I think that makes sense. Because then we would just need the RP0 tape, uh, the RP0 boot block. And if this was being done back in the day, then what would people would do is they would create a new installation tape from scratch for the next system. I mean, that is the only thing that... What's funny is that if this is actually how it works, which... Admittedly, I'm not convinced that I've got this right. Then these install instructions are completely wrong because this would actually cause a buffer overflow. Um, although this is installing to an RP6 and not an RP4. Uh... I mean, 
it makes sense. But I'm not convinced I'm doing this right. Well, you know what? There is a concept called YOLO. And if you enjoyed this YOLO content, um, you know, the Super Chat is right there. Feel free to subscribe or whatnot to the channel. It really does make a huge difference because I'd love to be able to do this full time with like no financial concerns. Because this is going to be part of a much larger project on documenting and reconstructing the ARPANET stuff. Although, I think I'm going to make a dedicated video on this nightmare. I, I don't know what else how to describe this. So, let's, let's just try this all again. Alright, so let's, let's point this up here. I don't think we're going to finish this all today, but... Uh, HP is RPO4, as far as I can tell. Uh, let's see here. So let's try... Let's make a new attempt for it, because I, I just want to start this all over from scratch. Let's grab the T-Boot. Ancient Unix. Arsis. And I will note that if I do not finish this today, I will be live streaming tomorrow at the same time, picking up right where we left off failure well it's an option but it's not an option that we're going to take lightly all right so let's try this again so let's just we're just going to install to the rp actually this is going to be a Fascinating and yet horrifying video at the same time. All right, so RK05 attach. So Unix v6 tap, v6 tap. I just imagine if I had to deal with real tape devices doing this. All right, so go zero. So let me look up the, because uh, I, I don't remember the commands offhand to do this. Uh, you know, like I should, it's not like we haven't typed these like a million times. All right, so this time we want to do tape to RK. 0, 100, 1, that's the boot sector. 1, 0, oh, 1. And that's the root partition. Like, if I actually figure out how to do this, I might even try writing a new install tape. Just to make this easier in the future. Because I'm pretty sure I know how to do it at this point. Um... All right, so that's all we need for that right now. Now we need to make the disk boot. Uh, so T boot in, disk boot in, D boot in. Uh, okay, so now all we need is the system start in single user mode. Boot RK0. Cool. We have we we have das boot. Cool. All right. So first. So now we need to configure this as the RX device as the root thing. So we basically just have to do what we did before, but slightly different. So RX, HP, TM, TC, 8DC, LP done. And then 
build a new kernel. I mean, we haven't even successfully restored the source code yet. We're just trying to even build the system. God, the this is a deep level sorcery. Uh, you know what? Scratch this entire line. Out m40o c.o lib1 lib2. All right, so that is the relinked kernel. Cool. All right, so now I'm going to just cheat and I'm just going to copy and paste in these commands because there is a way I can. Please tell me I'm still on screen. Yeah, I'm still on screen. I'm just going to copy and paste these commands from Linux because I, I, I've done this like four times already. And I did set this up so I could just do this. Oh, that was not what I intended to do. Copy. <laughs> That's, that, is, that is kind of neat. I'm not going to lie. All right. And now um, I'm going to skip restoring the rest of the OS, although maybe I should do it. Okay. Thank you, uh, Zindor, uh, Z Andura for the $5 super chat. <sighs> okay. So, and catching it from chat just for my sake of Sandy later, apparently HP stands for high performance because the disc, it was a disc drive that was originally made for um, <clears throat> um, what's the word I'm looking for? It was a disc pack that was originally made for IBM mainframes. So that should be basically all I need at this point. Like I could make the source disc, but I don't think we're going to actually need it. We don't even really need multi-user boot. Uh, so I think the only thing we need past this point is uh ec make node uh dev hd0 like i'm not even sure they would have used hd0 back in the day but it's consistent uh and i guess i would is it six hold on let me make sure that's correct Yeah, that's not going to work. That, uh, you know, that is less useful than I thought it would be. Let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Sorry, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, so six for the primary. Uh, and zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. No, wait, hold on. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, so it is 14. All right, so 14 is correct. So... Be uh, 14. So this was actually listed in the. Oh, wrong one. Uh, and that's the wrong file. I want. Well, there's an error message you don't see every day.
Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm just not going to worry about it. Let's see here. HP 060. Make no dev. Uh, RHP 0 C 12. No, not 12. 14. Okay. So make node dev. All right, so that's the root partition sorted. Um, let me bring OBS back. Let me bring OBS back. So if we look back at this, we could do one of the other partitioning styles because the right-hand number defines the number of cylinders. I think I'm happy with the original math as I calculated it. Although I'm not completely sure what why you would use it like this. I guess it's just different, easier sizes. Like, I'm pretty sure this math I did here is correct. I mean... So if that's the math I want to use, so zero, one, two, three, and that gives me the device minor. All right, so make node dev HP three block six three make node dev RHP three Character fourteen three. You know, I am just vaguely curious. Like, if I do this, how many sectors does it report? Cannot. Oh, right, because I haven't rebooted under the revised kernel. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, if I hit control D, yeah, no, I actually get stuck in multi-user mode. Uh, DD. That is annoying. All right, let me see here. HP zero. HP zero. Well, it recognizes the device. If we did the math, if I did read the source code correctly, this should come out when it finally finishes, which I don't know how long it's going to take to one should say that there's 11,264 blocks on that device. Jacob Davis, thank you for the $1 super chat. Okay. Uh, this is pre, this is pre standardization C compiler. It's basically K and R. Let's see here. That or this is completely crashed, which, you know, it's kind of an either or sort of situation. Well, that number doesn't agree with my number. How the hell did it get that number? Oh, I see how it got that number. Okay, let me, let me explain this because this actually, this actually is important. So I'm guessing the first size must represent the number of sectors you can use but cylinder 0 through 22 the ma what this is some mysterious ooga booga okay hold on but let's see here it's n blocks is the number of blocks there so i guess that makes sense and then it's the cylinder offset I think the comment is wrong. I don't think the comment actually refers to reality. I do know for a fact that there's a 32 megabyte architectural limitation in this version of Unix. So you couldn't even load a partition that size. So if I tried RP3, I should get this number with this offset. 
I'm gonna have to look at like the technical manual. Let, let's let's just try that and see if that's actually what we get. Like that is wacky. Yep. Um, there are cases of V6 Unix being used well into the 90s, and I honestly wouldn't be surprised if there's like some PDP hidden in some manufacturing facility or an emu like PDP 11 hardware was manufactured all the way until the 90s. Yeah. All right, so if this is actually how it works, then at least we know the exact parameters to give to make file system. Which is not a bad place to be, all things considered. Uh, because then we can do the dump, restore, and fingers crossed actually get somewhere with this. That, that would be, like, amazing. Uh, and then we could write out and copy the, M the source tape, which is the next thing we need to tackle. Um, this... This is pretty much black magic. Uh, the size of the hard drive that I'm talking about is probably about a refrigerator. I have i don't know if I've seen an RPO4 specifically, but I have seen period correct disk drives. And they were anywhere between a refrigerator to like, you know, like if you took my back wall over there, it would probably go up to about where the monitors are with a larger footprint. And that, okay, 2,900, that is exactly what the source code says should be, so I guess, uh, so I guess what we need to do then, we need to do a make FS. Um, this was not how I expected this would be installed, but I guess that works. So if we do make FS, dev rp0 9614 wrong command why did that should not have worked oh i probably made it wrong the first time yeah and there is absolutely no sanity checking on this if i get this wrong it will just break nine nine six one four so I check. Yeah. Okay, so the I nodes there are correct, and D check should give me a similar. Yeah, D check doesn't complain. So now if we do HP3, and that would be 20900. And we now have now we have a properly formatted HP device. <sighs> All right. So how do we move forward from here? I guess we need to restore the um, the dump tape. Uh, do we restore the dump tape as is, or do we restore the? I'm just I'm just gonna make a new dump tape. I think that's the easiest way to go. So attach TM0 dump. Okay. Set TM0 write enabled. Okay. So now I want to dump the entire file system to tape. I think I can just hold on. Can I just Uh, strike dump zero u is that work dump okay so that's going to dump that to tape cool now i want to run restore Oh, 
why do you give me a checks and error? Why why do you do this to me? Uh, I mean we had this happen. Oh yeah, okay, hold on. Restore. Oh right, I got that wrong. Restore RP. If I did this correctly, this will restore. Come on. Out of free list. Out of free list. What the hell does that mean? Free list is the list of empty blocks in a file system. Which makes me wonder if it choked because the draw disc is too big. Which is entirely possible. That or I screwed it up with the first command I tried. Uh, let me see here. Let me try 9-6... Yeah, well, the documentation is, uh, it's, it is mixed. The background music is a little bit quiet. That's kind of because Mac OS X makes doing background music at all kind of really annoying. Well, why does it mean it's out of free list? Let me try making the file system smaller. We don't need that big of a root file system. Uh, HP zero... Like, let's just try 5,000. I'm just, I've got my, I don't have high hopes at this point. Out of free list. All right, let's look at the source code because at this point I'm not getting anywhere. Uh, what we are looking for is an S1 command because it's from section one. At least I really hope that's where it is. Uh, right, this source code is incomplete. Um, let me find it, I can find it online. Uh, v6 unix restore.c. And I'll need it on GitHub. Let's, let's figure out where that command is, that's coming from. So let's grab this source and let's see if we find where it's located. S2. Okay, restore. Restore from incremental dumps. Character main. And then I just want to look for out of free list and then it complains out of blocks where is s block coming from file system last chance scribbling s system Files not restored, small I list. So D read, disk read one, block size. Where is it getting D read from? It's not a syscall. Is that a syscall? Okay. Disk read error is there. D 
D-Reed, D-Reed. I feel like this is a bug, but I'm not certain. Although, strictly speaking, maybe I don't actually need this. Okay, hold on. Let me let me think about this. Dump and restore were the standard ways of transferring data between different devices, but that's not the only way you could do it. Okay, so like out of so this this looks at blocks free. So if I want to look at so what is it telling me about HP zero? I get a lot of duplicate bad blocks. Is it possible that restoring a dump doesn't work? Yeah, look, because if you look at the I, I check value, uh, hold on, let me bring this back. Because I realize this is not pointing. So if I run I check, I mean, I get all these duplicate I nodes class free. Is it? Is it trying to restore the file system? Like, is it trying to restore the original free table and that's why it's gone completely bananas? I mean, that's that's actually entirely possible. All right, if that's the case, there is a second utility we can try. I don't know if it'll work, but I'm willing to try it. There is TP, which is the tape archiver. It didn't work well in my test sessions, but um, I'm not against it actually trying it. So let me try. So let's reinitialize uh, HP zero. Okay. So if I do an I check. Yeah, that comes out fine. So if I do, so we have TP, I want to do zero create Oh, wow, I actually panicked the system. That is an actual that's a system panic. All right, let's restart. I wonder if I could just move all the folders. Like, I don't have a tar command. What could I do to copy? Let, let me, let's look back at the install instructions because there's gotta be, there's gotta be some hints to this. There's gotta be some. Setting up Unix. Uh, let's go back to reconfiguring. Uh, reinstall, reconfigure, configuration tables, link the object tables, rewind, blah, 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 blah. Probooting for sync. Have partitions. Okay, special files. Make all the special files here. Use sys that run to, as a guide to recompile the change drivers. Install them. And disassemble the trap vectors, configuration tables, machine tables. Just uh, link it the object table, and if you have six fixed result, and booted. Okay. Raw mag tape device transmission between. Uh, this talks about extracting. Blah blah blah. That's not actually useful. Running out of swap space is not actually useful. And check. I think we're going to have to figure out how to hex at that blasted value. Like, really? 
let's see here. Let's look at dump. These include um, if you have the best way to move move to dump to mag tape, make a new one and restore the tape. Um, if you don't have mag tape, you can tell it where to put the file. It has to be increased. How to initialize? If you have the equipment, the best way to move a file system is to dump to mag tape, and then restore the tape. Uh, of course, we don't have a man command. That would only be on an installed system. See the section RP to manual. RP dump it in non overlapping structure. Um, add the sequence. If you only have an RP disk, some suggestions to lay the information on it contain the binary source and each of the files and longs, blah, 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 blah. I think we're going to have to try and edit this. I don't think there's another way around this. Because we're going to have to edit the install tape to understand the blocks. But uh, SimH doesn't use a linear tape format. At least I don't think it does. I would have to mod so to actually get this to work to install to an RP disk, which would have enough disk space to do what I would need. Now wait, hold on, hold on a moment. Maybe maybe I don't need to go that far. And and here's what I'm thinking. If, how many files, like, if I, do I have find? I do have find. How many files are we talking about? I mean, we're not talking that many files. I could do this by hand. Realistically, you know what? I could do this by hand. So why don't we just do it by hand? Like, why am I trying to be clever about this? As long as it doesn't lose permissions, there's no reason why this shouldn't work. Uh, so if I copy everything from here, you really only take one file at a time, don't you? I should have real words about that. <sighs> I don't even have the commands I need to copy this. Uh, int would have to be recompiled more 20 tell, uh, telewriters. Uh, console teletype, blah, 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 run consistency, dumping the file systems to do regular, um, RB controller is done free, DD special files, copy the D, uh, or store, even though stranded, wow, these manual, this manual is very much not super helpful. Okay, so here, here's where my brain is going with this. We have about a megabyte or so free on the root partition. That may be all we actually need. Let me, let me just check something. This, this might be a really stupid idea. If I make a test folder...
No space on device. Okay, that that's This is going really well. Let's let's free up some disk space. Um RK Unix Why am I P Unix test? Okay, that works. If I were to do test mount. Directory rename only. You cannot move it over file systems. That was not something I was expecting. Tape open error. Like, I don't really want to crash you again, but... TP... I, I got this to work earlier. I'm just... I am procrastinating a bit. Because I am trying to brainstorm on how to handle this. Because the restore command doesn't seem to work the way it's supposed to. Like, let's see here. Unix v6 restore. Um, setting up Unix. Yeah, so that's the programming manual. Uh, typeset the old manuals. Oh, 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 wait a minute. Here's something useful. So here's how you hit this. This is someone who's actually done something differently. Migrates an existing V6 install from an RK05 to an RL01 driver. So boot the system with the RK disk, a dump tape, and an RL01 drive attached. Dump the disk and restore and then write the boot sector. Okay, so how is he how's this done? So we we've basically done all this. And then they dump the tape and it gets restored. So that's going to dump. Why is it dumping 06 instead of like. Alright, I'm not going to. RP0. I mean, it's doing something. And then it runs out free list. But that doesn't make sense. I have this feeling something has gone wrong with this image. Just, just because I don't trust it anymore, I'm going to try this one more time from scratch. Because apparently this is supposed to work. Uh, go zero. All right. So TMRK disk offset. Um, okay. So they've got a nice handy guide to doing this right here. Uh, set installs V6. Uh, I gotta scroll all the way up because I just I want to make sure I get all the commands right. So disk offset one hundred one. That's the boot sector. One. One. Zero one. Three nine nine. That's the root file system. Okay. Abort.
and there we go. Now we're here. So now if we try this version of the instructions. Let's build a, all right, so, oh, hold on. SETI L case, ECK make node block. Oh, that's six. No, that would be six, zero. I'm only going to care about the root file system for now. Okay. Uh, mount, mount the arcade disc. Um, all right, so now we need to mount, put a new file system on it. Or let's do let's do the user one as well. HD three block six three. So far so good. Let's get the magic numbers we need. Nine six one four. All oh, right, because the uh, the kernel doesn't know what to do with that. Just ye uh, the, the right. So next thing we gotta do is reconfigure. I really do feel like I'm going around in circles with this. All right, so A out, make configure. And then this time I'm gonna actually put HP first. And we're just gonna get the absolute minimum we can get. Um, all right, so if I look at C, let's see, where does it say the swap partition exists? Can't be zero. Number is, is like, is there a dedicated spot for that in the table? Actually, maybe? Swap device is block device six to zero. That, that does not look right. Not be zero numeric swap. Okay, so it needs to immediately follow block size. Okay, so the swap LO variable is the place of where it will begin. This is freaking deep voodoo. I feel like I'm going around. I, I feel like I'm going the wrong way with this one. So hold on. Let me let me stop and think for a moment. If we use an RK05 disk pack as the root partition, we could use the RL uh, the the HP drive as the user partition. And honestly, honestly, that should be good enough. Or maybe not. No, I actually do think I have to get this correct because you don't mount on slash user in this version. So if I look at my partition sizes, what's available? I think I have to, let me see here. So if we go CC, this actually may explain why we've been having problems. OK. 
Okay. Um, let us change this line into swap LO, and then the starting block would be 9615. Yeah, is that... That should work, right? Oop. Uh... Well, almost. So change. So what I'm doing right now is trying to define the size of the swap partition. All right, and hopefully I did that correct. Fingers crossed. Um. From what I'm seeing in this document, that might be correct. No, actually, that is not correct. Okay. Um, because it's a block size thing. Now, he here's how we have to do this. Now, I, now I'm a, I see it. Um, okay, so... Here's what I think we have to do. We want to put the starting block at 8,000. And the reason is when we format the partition, we'll decrease the size of it to 7,999. Um, yeah, that, that actually makes sense to me. I don't know if it, it's correct. But at this point, I will take my small victories where I can find it. All right. Uh, I am not convinced on any of this. Uh, okay. So at this point... Because now we need to rebuild and relink. So now we've got the replacement kernel we need. Okay, so now Unix 2. Well, that's interesting. It actually started and then it crashed. Oh. Because it tried to load swap space. Well, that would actually explain why it was hanging before. Yeah, and I just corrupt. I think I just corrupted the boot image. Okay. 
Yeah, that actually makes perfect sense now. Just, just out of curiosity, if I do HP Unix here, yeah, you can't actually start because you don't have your root file system. Okay. That okay. This is actually made. This is headway as much as it doesn't look like it because I do think I'm starting to understand how this blasted thing goes together. So the restricted rights message has to be coming from the kernel. Uh, user sys. Okay. Um, we need to change this. Root dev. Zero eight zero conf. Oh, I didn't like that. Why didn't it like that? So we're here. Let's change this line. Root dev zero eight. Okay, so that puts the root device and the swap device in two separate locations. All right, so LD A out M 40 O C that O please, please work. Oh, uh, that won't work. So basically we need a temporary boot system that can handle, uh, basically handle the early boot. So now if we do that and then we reboot, please work. Yes. Okay. All right. Wow. We have almost no free memory available. So, okay. So here, here's basically what it boils down to at this point. Um, the swap space has to exist for the system to run. It can be on the, the, the disc pack or it could be on the actual drive. It doesn't, really matter it just has to be there so if now that we have a kernel that we can okay uh why don't i have a city oh it, you know it helps if you don't have caps lock enabled that that's an important safety tip Make file system dev HP zero. And then we want to limit this to seven, seven, nine. Because I set the swap space to start at 8,000. And then that handles the beginning of it. So now let's attach a new tape. Uh, okay, so now dump. I'm really crossing my fingers in this one. Dump zero U dev rk0 oh uh, well it helps if rk0 exists
I'm really hoping folks are finding this interesting. Please ask questions in chat. I will be glad to like spend a little bit of time explaining. No space undev zero zero. Jump zero U. Oh, it doesn't have the tape device. That's why it broke. Uh, MT zero. I really got to make like a better base image, but man, I have questions about what I'm doing. All right, so let's see if that dumps out. And now let us see if we can restore. If not, I'm going to try, if this doesn't work, then I'm going to try this set of image. I don't like using someone else's image without knowing anything about how it actually works, but what can you do? All right. So restore R dev HP zero. Please work. No space left on the device. Oh, right, because the disk node doesn't actually exist. Uh, dev HP zero block six zero. Bad free block. Oh, because it. Maybe. Maybe. But why? Why? Why is it having this much trouble? When I do a dump, how many files does it say? Incremental dump, epoch, zero phase errors. I mean, that's more or less what it should be. of all those blocks and then if I immediately do a restore r dev oh nope 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 that is not where that one goes yeah maybe I should try that actually maybe the hp zero driver is shot <laughs> I mean, as far as I know no one's actually like ever tried this Bad free block. I mean, it's a different error. Just, just out of curiosity. If I draw that restored. Why did that restore? Like, what? No, that actually restored. Why did that work? (laughs) 
Why did that work? That that doesn't make sense. So I initialized the file system to use 5,000 blocks and it worked? Isn't that that does not make a lot that makes no sense to me. So it works when I put 6,000. It's not going well because it's running on Ooga Booga Magic. Which I don't like. So let me try 7,000. And we get checksum error. All right, sorry, it's R, not F. Okay. All right, so that works. Is it like a max file system thing that I don't know about? If I try 7,000. And it works. What? I mean, that's the correct value. What did, did magic gremlins come when I was not looking? Okay, so like if we look at the swap, it starts at block 8,000. Did I make a mistake earlier? All right, before, before I go any little bit more mad, Let's install the boot sector and let's let's see if we can actually boot the damn thing. So I would need uh I'm guessing it's HPU boot. Which one is the correct I'm not sure which one the correct is the correct one. I'm going to guess it's HPU boot. OF dev HP0 count equal one. We're not quite done yet because I need to relink, need to relink the kernel. But that's a working if very strange. Like that's a that's like that's really that's a what the f sort of result. I'm not even sure how we're going to get the source code onto this. That's going to be an entirely separate kettle of fish like i almost feel like i need to write like a proper move utility uh okay so if that really was the problem then all i need to do here is change the root dev 
to six. I I'm what I'm 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 just oh uh did I get this one wrong yeah I did get this one wrong uh int root dev six colon colon eight. Cool. All right. So let's relink this kernel. Um, I'm still deeply confused on how we got here. But I'm not sure I'm going to question it because if I keep questioning it, my brain might like melt. So check file systems. Uh, okay, so let's let's do the actual link before I run into any more weirdness. So ld x out a forty o c dot o lib one lib two mount. Uh, HP Unix. All right, I need to see if this actually worked because I'm going to be deeply confused if it did. Deboot. Uh, okay, so really we just get rid of this and change you to that. Like, why did that work? Under what world, like, what did I do differently there that didn't work on the other one? I, I'm feeling really, really confused at the moment. I'm like, now I'm questioning, should I try and format the other partition? Like, how much how much disk space do I have free? Because we might have enough now. We might have enough now, but I have to get the source code loaded on here. Although, I probably could just mount the R. Like, do I really need it on this? I am deeply, deeply confused. How do, uh, like, I'm gonna have to watch the the vod to figure out what what I did differently on that one. And I'm not sure where I want to go next with this so one. Uh, actually, no. The first thing I want to do is I want to make a flipping backup because, um, RP zero disk RP zero somehow magic install work. Yeah, we're we're just. We're just going with that. Like, 
That was not how I expected this to go. But okay. I'll, I'll take it. So... Now I need to figure out how we're going to move on from here. We can only have one copy of Unix on an RP device, but you can boot Unix uh, V7 Unix from tape. So I kind of want to try and do that. Like, it should be possible to boot it from tape. Last chance before scribbling the disk. Um, because we could load it. Because we still have to get that source code of the network. Either we do the V6 tar thing which I'm sort of thinking is going to be the less painful of the two routes, or we have to somehow match to get the dis this loaded under um, V7. Although V7 may not be as bad as I think it will be. I, fe I feel like the instructions here for V6, like we basically just need a boot desk and then we can do it. So... Let me get the V7 tape and let me see if we can actually like do something with it. Um, V7 test and because I'm not, I'm not hugely optimistic about this, but let's see if I can get somewhere. Like if I make a video out of this, I don't even know what I'm going to say about it. RP0. Actually, uh, I don't want RP0. I want RX0. V7 boot disk. Oh, wow, something broke, something broke. What broke? That was bizarre. I feel like I feel like the whole thing has become like possessed by some sort of horrible demon. Because that is about the only thing I can use to describe this experience thus far. So boot TM0. Uh I have TM0 tap. Okay. So now we're in the mini boot environment for this. So if I do TM03, this gives me the make file system utility. So if I set a block size of 5000 and I want to just initialize RK00 sector 2 write error um, it probably doesn't know what to do with an RK style image which is unfortunate. I am probably going to have to build tar for V6 Unix. I didn't, I'm not seeing another way to do this. <sighs> Unless, I don't think dump is compatible. It would be nice, but I don't think it is. And when I tried using the TP disk archiver, it just blew up last time I tried it. All right, let's, we have a copy of tar for V6. I say we try it. Um, I just have to figure out how we're going to do that. 
So if we go back to the desktop, Here. Simple ones are here. Uh, instead of adding using the alternative F sync, uh, use the standard IO library is here. You name and we have to add all these header files. I mean, it doesn't look hard. All right, let's let's just try it just because at this point I am starting to go a little bit mad. So let me grab a terminal window and this is shared with this is like a the screen instance that shared. So this is on the same machine. So PDP 11 deboot to in and this is still going to come up in single user mode. Um, and then we need HP Unix. Did I just call it Unix? Yeah, I did. SETI L case. Because I need to be able to copy and paste, which is why I'm doing it this way. Let's see here. Sys. Do I have a dot H folder? Like there's almost no headers. Yeah, you know what? Let me just make a source folder. And then what we're going to do is this. Because I don't think there's a studio, you know, none of these header files exist on this version of Unix. And then I can just copy and paste them in. This is not what I call a high tech way of doing data transfer, but it does work. So cat types dot H. And stat dot H. Dir dot H. And signal dot H. And then we just need to load the tar utility, which is a part from, okay, so tar C. Okay, so that's still transferring. It's a fairly long program. Uh, there is no networking. We are trying to compile the networking stack. Okay, yeah, this is actually still going because I'm watching it on the glass terminal still running like here let me switch it like you can literally see it typing in because i copy and pasted it in cool that actually worked i'm just the the, the secret though is i am really that fast at typing so ken that's a lot of compiler errors that's a lot of, um please stop please stop <laughs> Okay, um, so apparently I need to make a lib.h. Oh, you're kidding me. I have to do this one at a time? Apparently I do. Okay, signal.h. This is how you install your standard library. And this is like all backports. And yeah, no, that's still pretty well broken. All right, so while that error is out, what else is going wrong? It needs at least one syscall. You need the header files here. 
better default Im like this i knew about is um some of the s binaries let's remove all modify dates unchanged let's see compile them Is there really a move all command that I didn't see? Okay, so there is apparently a copy all command that I didn't know about. Let's see here. V6, MIPS. All right, so if I want to compile this v6 tar like this is what i was concerned about uh this tarified v6 let me let me output these errors somewhere else let me let that run because so i want to see what it's dying on Uh, and then I want to do so s printf undefined. Okay, so it really does not like any of that. Like, do I need to update the C compiler? Okay, well, that's sort of annoying. There is a set. So I did actually know about this. I didn't want to use it for reasons. There were updated versions of V6 Unix. What we've been using is the original uh, Bell Tape, but there's a patched one from Tim Chopa. It was a dump from a running system that has a lot of mess. Like, like it was a running system. Like, there's documentations, biology lab data. It's been patched heavily, but apparently it... Um, Apparently, that's something we need, including the newer C compiler. Actually, didn't I have a newer C compiler in the... Um... Like, I don't even know how you would copy it over. Let me, let's, let's look for this document, because maybe there's something here I don't know about. Uh, V6 Unix, getting the emulator up and running. First things to do, mounting other disks. Um, adding devices. Yeah, that's fine. Let's see here. So apparently there are some commands here that can actually copy it this is for a different emulator called um extra z uh or like i forgot what it's called it's a it's actually a commercial emulator although it's been abandoned where for many many years but i mean this talks about adding a custom driver to do this which i really don't want to do not not if i can avoid it I am starting to wonder if I am going to have to code a utility to do the data transfer, though. Like, I'm trying to think on how I could possibly do this, and I'm coming up with sort of blanks. Although maybe it's not a complete lost cause. Hold on a moment. No, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Maybe maybe this is not as lost cause as I thought it was. Let me let me see here. Uh The reason I say this is not 
possibly as lost cause as I think it is. There is an additional back-end driver that we haven't been using called, um, I mean, there's a few. Let's, let's be kind of honest about this. I can't easily load tar in, but we could... Like, I can't use RP because that apparently conflicts. How, how big is that? How big is the source code realistically? Because if I could just, you know, if we just make it smaller, maybe we can do it that way. Like, if we look here. How big is this really? Is 5.2 megabytes. We could do it in multiple trips. Maybe. If I can figure out... I I wonder if I were to put the dump utility from V7 would that I don't think that would help me what I need is a larger disk is what I really need 5 megabytes of source code that is actually a lot can we uh, I don't know thin this out a little bit because I don't think we need all this Like, where is this being used? Because probably a lot of this is just old, dilapidated code. Like, what is MH? I mean, I see a lot of dot .o and stuff. Like, if we get rid of all the dot .o files, and we get rid of file, null proc, rmc, pretty much everything I can compile from scratch. 5.1. I mean, that doesn't really help all that much. So let me jump in. Let me. So we don't have tar. We do have. AR, but that doesn't really help. We do have dump and restore, but it didn't work across Unix versions when I tried it. That being said, I could have potentially have done that wrong. Yes. Uh, the C system, the, the bracket is just a uh, tab, white space. So I've got 5.1 megabytes I need to load in. I've got, I finally have a hard drive large enough I can use it, but I don't have a good method of getting stuff in. By the way, is this actually a real command? Like, I'm going to be really, yeah, okay, that is apparently a real command. Copy all. I guess we could just do it as multiple round trips and we just split the directories up. I mean, it's not what I call elegant, but I only just need to do it the one time. Uh, so yeah, let's hop into V7 Unix land and let's see if we can actually do something with that. So if we go into ancient Unix, we go into V7, PDP 11, uh, and boot. Alright, 
so we're here attach Uh, RK0 NOS 1 disk. Okay, cool. Go. Uh, flip. I think I had to do, yeah, I had to do NL0. Oh, what is that command? Why do I never remember? It's SETI L case NL0 CR0. Or I just completely crashed the emulator because of course I do. Uh, boot RP0. My brain is start. I, I don't know. I'm I like, I might actually call the stream a bit early today just because my brain is starting to melt. Why am I having so much city problems? Let's see here. Boot RP0. I mean, I could port X modem, if I really, really wanted to try I think the terminal is doing that thing. Because this was a problem before. All right, let me let this boot up. Let me do a detach. Yeah, see, now, now it's fine. And now it has problems. Let's see, what is it actually doing? Because I can see this on the other screen. Yeah, no, it is actually having problems. I think screen is like lost its mind or something. What else is new? Yeah, like, see, I'm typing, and you see that latency? I'm just going to restart screen. I don't really need to be in screen, but it helps a lot. PDP 11 and boot in. Yeah, and see, now it's all nice and fast. I guess there's probably buffer issues. All right, so now we've got that. Let's attach the disk. RP0 not disk. Uh, RP0 dot disk. All right, so if we now make format the RK01, it should be able to be formatted to 5,000 because of course it's not there. Uh, oh, right, because I actually changed the image on this one. It's not Unix, it's RP Unix. Yeah, now I should be able to do. Oh, not again. <laughs> the lag. The lag, it, like, look at that lag. Why is it doing that? All right, I, you know, I'm just going to stop running this in screen for the time being because it's not really helping and it's kind of hurting a lot. Once it's set up, it's not actually that bad to use. The problem is I have no documentation. I'm literally 
flying by about the seat of my pants. Uh, all right. So now we need to attach RK zero. No, wait, that was done correctly. So now we just do a go make file system. Oh, hold on. here nl0 cr0 make file system dev rk0 5000 okay okay all oh, right I, ha I actually have the cd command in this version what a novelty that is Um, I don't have the source code on this one. I thought I extracted it. Is it in user? It's not in user. All right, so now we need to attach the tape. Which, uh, I gotta look up how you do that again. I'm really, really hoping this works. Because we can do this in, like, three trips if it actually does work. If not, I'm sort of out of ideas for the moment. We'll probably have to do some really not fun patching if we have to do that. TM0 VF tar... TM zero Wow, I this command syntax drives me a little bit crazy. No, it's attached TM zero VFB tar five twelve. And I will bring the background music back. I just realized how long we've gone like without it. Okay, so there's the tape marks. The the madness is spreading. Okay. So if we go. I think I can just do instant I think I can just do tar zero XV. Yes, and that will actually extract it. Cool. Alright, so now we've got the source extracted on a V it ran out of disk space. It ran out of disk space. Why did it run out of disk space? <sighs> I'm just trying to think of how I want to tackle this. You know, I know exactly how I think I'm going. I know I... I wonder if I do, where are we? PDW. Yeah, okay, hold on. First, let's erase that. RP3 is on user. That's fine.
actually... Is that a solution? Yeah, let's restore the tape here. Because RP free is not being used. There should be plenty of disk space there. And then we run out of disk space. Because of course we do. Why would anything else be the case? What were they building this on that they had five megabytes of usable disk space? I think we got to try and cut this down to size. There, there, there's no way this is actually five megabytes worth of source code. I mean, it's possible. But I very much have my doubts. Because 5 megabytes of source code would be a monster. I mean, 5 megabytes would be a monster thing for that time period. If we can get it under 2.5. Like, if we get... Like, we have most of these. Like, these... Like, these are kernel config files. We don't... I don't think we need these. So let's let's see how much of this we can just shave off. Like we have the original, so I'm not like super worried about getting rid of stuff. So we have Ken. That's probably one of like Ken Thompson's one of his folders. Uh is like Ken actually used somewhere? No, it's not. All right, so let's get rid of Ken because that's almost certainly a config file. All right, now we're down to 4.4. .4. What else can go away? Probably anything that's an O file, we can just all toss because we're going to compile this from scratch. 4.2. Uh, we don't need that. Probably don't need the .a files because I think we're going to be able to compile those ourselves. All right, four megabytes. We still got room. Let's see what else can go away. And uh, I'm probably on the wrong camera. Oh, no, I am on the right camera. All right, let's see what else is, like, really, really bloated. So there's a bunch of stuff in NCPP. Like, what is in here that's eating up all this space? Wow, Telnet was a fairly large binary. Although I'm having second thoughts about this approach. <sighs> I don't know. I am almost wondering if I'm going to have to code a utility to do this type of transfer. I mean, on one hand, I'm kind of tempted to call this a success and wrap it up here because we did figure out how to put V6 units on a large hard drive, but we're not 
doesn't actually help anywhere as much as I'd hope it would. Like, if, if we had a big enough drive to load even four megabytes, it would be easier. Or we'd have to figure out how to get tar working. I mean, there is one utility that sort of helps, but not really. Uh, go. Like, there's the TP program, which is the uh, tape program. Uh, I'd have to do a full V6 install to make that, uh, V7 install to make that work. Like, if we look at Unix 6 edition uh, manual TP, and then we look in the manual file. Probably in general commands, although maybe, I don't know, there it is, TP. Manipulate deck tape or mag tape. Updates the tape, extracts the tape. Other arguments refer to the tapes that are, like, I tried this and it just did not work well. Tape directory... I'm just looking to see what else is here that might actually help. Because obviously there's commands here I don't know about. So there's the C debugger. There's got to be a way we can handle this. Otherwise, I'm going to have to write a utility. I'm thinking that's what it's going to come down to. Which I really don't want to do, but... See, we've got. Uh, let me catch up on ca catch up on stuff. Um, the low. I, I I at least want to have a plan for the next stream because right now I'm kind of just spinning my wheels before I go any further. I mean, right now. So here's here's the potential paths going further. Let's get let's get the note document back out. So we did confirm that we can install to an RPO4 disk, which is actually a pretty big deal because now we understand how large disks work under Unix. And it does make a fair bit of sense that network Unix required a larger disk. It wouldn't have worked with the small 2.5 megabyte ones because you would need to be able to receive network messages. There would be FTP. I mean, it would really be straddling the line between a mini computer and a mainframe with the real difference being storage. So there is that. The problem I'm keep coming back to is, is there a way we could load this with the dump utility? Like, if we could do that, it would make lives a lot easier. Let me see here. Let's keep an eye on how the stream is doing right now. Oh, we're at 140. That's not bad. Um... As usual, if you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. If you really enjoyed this content, um, or watch me just go completely mad in the process. So if we look here in number eight, in section eight, we do have the dump command, which is what I was using earlier. So dump, full dumps should be taken in a quiet file system as follows. Incremental dumps more than one tape yeah okay so that's that's pretty much exactly what i knew beforehand 
key argument is what it was done before RP0. It's interesting how this lists formatting RP0 as 4600. Because we did see that magic number earlier. Because that actually appears here for, uh, is it the same number? Yeah, 40600. Is RP got a different partitioning table? Yeah, okay, it does actually have a different partitioning table. That explains it. Because, all right, so, or at least that partially explains it. And then there is the RL01 disk driver, which... How big is this? Like, is this big enough we could actually use it? Because I could, we could patch this driver in. There's nothing saying we can't. Because if we can make an RL01 disk, which I seen mentioned, maybe? So what was the RL01? Removable disk pack. The R RL01 is a 5 megabyte disk drive. The RL02 is 10 megabyte. The latter is a high density with more tracks per surface. That might be the way to do this. Because... Here, here. We, we can tell a lot about the system that this was designed for because there are drivers here that for hardware that wouldn't have been here in the original. Like, um, let, let's let me pull this up side by side because th this requires a bit of explanation for you to understand where I'm coming from. So, uh, yeah, I close screen, but is this? Uh, if we look at the stock V6 source, which we've got here. So we go to V6, DMR. These are the drivers that were in the original release. And you notice that there's no RL driver. Because the device would not have been available at Bell Labs when this release was finalized. But it is present here. And we saw a mention of that in the other documentation that existed. So we could merge the RL02 driver in. Uh, let me figure this out. How does this work? Because there has to be a low and high density mode for this to work. Uh, blocks. On a dual drive, doesn't manage seek. Okay, so this is just an RL01 drive, but I mean, that's still an improvement. What else we got? We have an RX floppy drive. How much storage is on one of those bad boys? I, like, I'm actually curious. I, I mean, at least I'm learning things as we go, which is going to be kind of important going along this process. But I also feel so so much out of my depth it's not even funny um yeah so if we want to look at the pp11 documentation what was those so that would be a probably an rk11 disk drive how big were these rx01 floppy drive Holding 256 kilobytes. Do they have a... Okay, I mean, it is a floppy drive. That is legit. But it's not exactly what I would think. Right now, we're trying to figure out how we're going to do restoration going forward. I got. I, I, right now, I'm spinning my wheels. 
because the utility I need doesn't exist, for want of a better word. The C compiler I have is a little bit too geriatric to be able to even build the V7 tar. So I am kind of thinking we're going to have to merge the RL driver. Like we have RL here. And then if we combine that with this, because this is a mod, this is an updated version of the utility. I don't know where the, I don't remember where it grabs all its magic numbers from. Uh, it's probably like ctab.h. I mean, I, I've seen this in the past. ctab.h. Uh, interestingly, it doesn't list an RL driver. Let's see, it scans configuration file for a specific entry. There's MK. I mean, we basically just would have to build the driver in and just assign the numbers by hand. It's doable. It's like, I'm, I don't. I'm trying to think of any reason why that wouldn't work. But I mean, then you see that how this is missing things. Oh, is this the table? Oh, okay. You know, here's the table of like all the magic things that we can get. <sighs> they probably read this in with paper tape. It was that or mag tape. So there's card reader. There's the RX-11 floppy drive. ARPANET interface. Yeah, modem interface. These are all the things that they basically added for ARPANET stuff, including a video display and a graphics display, which are definitely things that are not part of the stock system. If we look at their c.c file, how did they modify this? Yeah, wow, they actually really t they actually tinkered with this. So we can see how actually to pacify the v7c compiler. I had some thoughts that they were building this on a v7 system. Like, if you were to build the whole thing on V, there, there's no technical reason why you couldn't build on top of V7 and then make a V6 distribution tape. Like, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. You just need the scripts to. You you just need a way to. Let's, let's just see what let's see what hardware they were working with because if I know the hardware they were working with it would make things simpler because look they're booting from the RL0 device which we don't have um it's it wasn't in the v6 kernel they they really cut this down to size the only device drivers they included were the RK disk cassettes and the RL driver there and only to find two block devices. And then literally everything else they got rid of. It's just RL, memory, TTY, uh, imp is the network control protocol interface. And that was it. And then it defines RL01s have 10,220 blocks, which would be, um, uh, it would be, yeah, just, just over five megabytes. And if you have multiple drives daisy chained together, because I believe you, let, let's look, look at this. So did they not, they must have not had a hard drive. Up to four drives may be attached to a single controller. The drives are connected serial. Um, 
serially. So you'd have one drive probably of the root partition. You'd have the R, uh, the RX packs with the Unix source code, most likely. Because that driver was still in there. Yeah, because this is what it's supposed to look like. It, it, it's basically a slot with a drive. And a lot of really cool blinking likes. I would love to see one of these in person. We do have VC. Uh, so Pat, catching up on chat. I'm sorry if I haven't really been paying attention to chat today. The current status is we've got V6 Unix working. We I I now feel like I understand V6 Unix well enough that I could tinker with its soul, uh, which you know is not the worst thing in the world. V7 Unix. We the problem is that we have no easy way to do data exchange between V6 and V7. But there is some indicate, you know, to pacify V7C compiler. I mean, there is no technical reason that I can think of on why you could not build on V7. I mean, it didn't change much. Fundamentally, the C compiler is still targeting the PDP-11 instruction set. So, let's look at their build scripts, because maybe I've been looking at this wrong. So, this talks about bugs in the C compiler. So there's an error in the compiler's model value. So they were building on V6. Because it's a later V6 system. But apparently... You know, I think there's details of the Unix story that are missing. Because if we go to good old Wikipedia. And we look up Unix v6. It doesn't talk about updating it. There were, there were known distributions and spin-offs from the BSD Why didn't I think about that before? Um It is possible they were building on BSD because that would that would not have oh, oh. all right so let me explain this I gotta get the family tree out all right so this is where we are right now in the very very early family tree of Unix Unix versions five to six because of the legal situation with AT and T and computing. Combined with a very ambiguous license, the University of Berkeley made their own version of V6 Unix called the Berkeley Software Distribution, or BSD. The first version of BSD 1 and 2, because Unix version 6 was released in 1976, more, uh, yeah, 75 or 76. I am 
seriously wondering if they were building on top of BSD. Because there's no indication that I can know of. Someone in chat could correct me. That... That Bell ever released an updated V6. There were very clearly updates to it. But I don't think there was ever a formalized release. Most of the, from what I know, yeah, like, let's see here. Uh, so a larger PDP 1170, which makes sense because that would be a larger PDP system. And then here we go. And then Ken Thompson talks about this here. Ken Thompson helped installed Unix version six and started working on a Pascal implementation while at Berkeley. And this is where it gets important. Graduate students Chuck Hilly and Bill Joy improved Thompson's Pascal implementation and improved and created an improved text editor known as EX. That's actually would become Vi. Bill Joy is a very important name in the story because he would go on to found Sun Microsystems. And then in 97, in 77, Joy started building the first BSD release. I am wondering. I am distinctly wondering if they were on top of a BSD release building this. Because as far as I know, this source code was made. Like, hold on, let's let's look at this. Uh you let, let's see if we can let's work backwards here. So UNSC, what what could UNSC be? That would be on the ARPANET uh, logical map. Let's look at the uh, because that would list every node on ARPANET. Seventy seven should be good enough. Like I don't need perfect. I just need okay. So this is everything connected to ARPANET at this time. Like here's BNN, BBN. They were the companies that made the, the imps. So what I am looking for, so this is unfortunate. It doesn't actually say what model of PDP machines these are, uh, but you can see the larger sites here and Illinois is up here and Illinois was one of the larger sources of early computer lore they made the plato system they did um they did a fair number of stuff that unfortunately history has kind of forgotten and i mean down here you have the pentagon uh nsa arpa itself is here meter all right that was definitely nowhere near as useful as i want but you can actually see how much of the network was running on PDP hardware. I mean, that was a lot on PDP hardware, but uh, you know what I'm not seeing? I'm not seeing Berkeley. It should be over here because here's Stanford. Here's um, Emmys. That's a military facility. Uh, there's Rand Corporation, uh, UCLA. I mean, they should be here. Why am I not seeing them? Well, BSD was sort of like, um, how do I explain this? BSD was not an operating system in and of its own right at this point. It was essentially a customized version of Research Unix v6. Um, I'm not exactly sure what changed. I, I didn't even think of looking down this particular road, but if they were building this in 78 or 79, like let, let's go back to the install instructions. Cause I think, I feel like we're going the wrong way on this. So this document, 
this note describes the expected environment that this distribution expects to live in and what must be done to a standard vanilla v6 unix in order to build a network system but i mean you, then you get these joy this this these joy things like other c modules that were changed check with glenn i don't even know who glenn is And there's no guarantee that this note is up to date with this distribution. Let's see, like, like the stuff in this document file that, I mean, that's a 75 and this one's a 79. So it doesn't completely, oh, you know, I'm sorry. I, I am behind on the super chats. Michael Crot, thank you for the $50 super chat donation. Really, that's an, a lot one. And thank you to Abel uh pxxz2 for the 200 uh sorry 20 mexican peso donation it is hugely appreciated i really want to get down to visiting mexico again i haven't been down there in a really long time oh oh we have emails we have emails from when this system was in use so maybe we can learn something useful about this uh where do we want to start because that's going to be interesting. Uh, message received from N uh, NOSC SDL. So that was ARPANET email addresses were username at system name. There was no proper domains, but this was a mailing list probably. Um, and it was on Pacific time, which is interesting. So the new system has arrived. It's been very stable this week, so I think I'll distribute it next week. I would have done it this week, but I've gone skiing for four days through Tuesday, so I won't be around if any problems cropped up during the weekend. Uh, process of normal interrupts. Okay, so we're basically reading a bug report. We're reading a 50-year-old bug report here. Uh, it would seem very awkward to only permit the super user to log in when shut SW was set. Uh, define the system group now to trusted users that now that S, uh, sudo uses the same mechanism. So this looks like this is when they were starting to add access controls to the system because Unix by and large for this time period really, um, really operated on, shall we say, a trust system. There was no memory protection on the PDP 11. There was paging, but you could ruin someone else's day if you were really not like trying, you know, if you were not all that concerned. Uh, so they were definitely building this like right at the end of 79. They had to be building this here. They were doing a lot of modules and various building more weeks distribution. Like, let's see if there's any sort of help here they're talking about running it on a slash 40 and 45 class machine so those were the for this time period that would have been so that the entry level pdp system was the 23 but you could barely run unix on it it was like more of a novelty to run unix on that 40 and 45 they would have been showing their age in 79 they would have still been usable but i'm surprised they were supporting it i mean arpanet had a lot of money behind it okay so they were definitely using so what is nosc i thought it's gotta be like is this on the arpanet map let's let's see if we can find this so we know we're looking for something on the west coast um, and granted, this map is not 100% complete. Let's see here, LB. Like, I've not even been able to find a surviving copy of the host table. Like, to say the ARPANET stuff is rare is something of a really flipping bad understatement. I mean, you have UCLA. I mean, it's quite possible it's not on this map. We have RRCC. 
I mean, they may have not even been on the plural bus system, for all I know. Because I don't even know. Uh, just because random Googling is always a dangerous school. Well, the first thing that came up was New Orleans School of Cooking, which I don't think... Navy, Navy Operations Support Center. Yeah, I think that's Navy Operations Support Center. Ah, okay. Hold on, hold on. We just... I just found a note that I had not seen earlier. This actually explained... This is apparently is context for the tarball I downloaded. Uh, first networked Unix system was produced at Illinois University of Illinois... 40, uh, 74, 75 using NCP. Mostly written by let's see here, Gary Grossman and Steve Hahnemann. That's fine. So this is a revised version of this. The dates are not going to be completely accurate because on V6 Unix, the date got updated every time the file was accessed. It was a known quirk um, and not a nice one. So, yeah, so um, N NOSC is Naval Ocean System Center. Wow. Uh, acronym collision. Okay. Um, and other useful things here is the MH Mail Reader from RAND and MMDF Mail Agent. I do think trying to get this compiled is actually really going to be valuable. Yeah, so code for the kernel device drivers. So, so okay, so this did definitely... So, assuming this is correct, which I'm not completely convinced, but we do have more here. We actually have some more research papers that this is going to be amazing. What am I looking at? I'm looking at a binder. And a book. Looking at a very short book, apparently. 24 pages. Okay. Now we're... Wow, this is a lot of stuff. I mean, that's... In, I, I know this is in the source code, but look how the, it, they're referring to hosts. Let me blow this up. Like, it's DevNet and a host name. Like, that's how Plan 9 did it, if I remember correctly. Which would actually explain a lot of plan nine design decision because th this is how they're showing doing networking operations that you just open it as a file and if it doesn't open the machine is dead or you just do write and it was all done as a telnet connection all right so let's see if there's anything else because yeah, so here's the documentation on Telnet, some NCP. This is actually incredibly useful. I'm really happy I found this. Because finding anything on ARPANET is flipping hard. Uh, I will drop this link in chat. Now, I do know for a fact that some of the things I've run into have had, shall we say, accuracy. Uh, oh, this is exactly what I needed. This this explains what the system uh, what this was expected to run on. The network software for Unix was developed on a PDP eleven fifty with memory management, two RK05 disk packs, two nine track mag tape drives, four deck tape drives, thirty two kilobytes of core that's just memory, and three terminals. It's uh, been expanded to have a DH11 terminal multiplexer. Uh, essentially, it's a dial-in system. Not so much a dial-in system, but um, it would let you connect more than three terminals, but you'd still be limited to three in total. Um, they, they added a twin platter RF11 fixed head disk. User files are stored on the RPO3. We've been playing with an RPO4. Let's see here. RP03. 
Uh, I mine came off the the Unix uh, Heritage Society. Okay, so what we so the RPO free was a forty one megabyte hard drive. You know that makes perfect sense. Now I I'm a little bit interested. So I don't think Unix supported more than one large hard drive per device, even though the hardware actually supported it. So th this is actually really quite useful. So user files are on the the RPO three. The RF eleven was used as a swap disk on a fixed head hard drive and temporary file storage. One RX05 platter had the system files. The other had login and credential information. So that's probably slash user or possibly the F folder or possibly user net, which is what we're trying to compile. here so this tells us a bit more about it so in the near future the system will be expanded to have 128 kil kilobytes of memory well words uh well i guess it doesn't really matter that's about right um because a byte would be a word on a pdp 11 base system uses 24.5 words that's understandable um oh yeah for those who didn't know uh, Unix is a product of New Jersey, which probably explains a lot. Okay. 14 variable. At the time of writing, Network Unix has been running on a full-time basis for about four weeks. During that period, there were between three and four crashes a day. That is a thing of flipping beauty i think the rest of the stream we're just going to keep doing research because i need to figure out how we're going to try and tackle this but we now know what the final picture actually looks like like what it what it's supposed to look like um so it's Provide it gratis, develop without ARPA support. Oh, this is actually one of the very, I've never seen this before. This is actual numbers on what Bell was licensing Unix for, because this was under NDA. This should not have been published. Bell Laboratories must be contacted for a license to the base system itself. Bell's policy in the past is to license the system for universities for a nominal fee, $150. What was that in, uh, I'm going to say this was 1955 to 2022 inflation. I'm just, I'm curious. What, what does $150? 825? You know, I, the, that's probably still usable. Let's see here. And then they wanted 20 grand for non-university installations. And that was the, shall we say, giant pain point. <laughs> Six figures today. The giant pain point of Unix back in these days. <laughs> Let's keep reading. Um... So, apparently Bell was in negotiations for an ARPA network-wide license. That is something I've seen is, by and large, it wasn't called ARPANET back in the day. It was always called the network or network users more than anything else. So, what else do we have here? Uh, Telnet, there, Telnet proves reliable. This is actually really useful because this gives me proof of things that were running on the ARPANET. Because I know there are inaccuracies here. Um, so we have NetMail, Network FTP, which I knew about. That's Remote Job Entry. And it's very interesting that they, you know, it, it it's 
it's kind of weird how they were running it all as user programs because you that's not how you would do it in today's day and age. It's also procedural call protocol. That's probably one of the first RPC things. I have not seen mention of this before, so this is actually really useful. I want to save this PDF because this has been a freaking gold mine of information. Because really, I want to do a comprehensive documentation of ARPANET. I then want to do the TCP IP era, which would be the early BSDs. And then I want to talk a lot about social networking, but these are all going to be different videos. Like, this is the first video where I am going to have to research every aspect of it because I have very little pre-existing knowledge on it so what's this one volume one this looks like a scarily long book 180 uh pages but we could probably skim most of it center for advanced computing let's just let's let's look at it at a very high level uh okay this is basically like amazing so this talks about all the daemons and stuff that powered the early ARPANET. I don't think this is actually useful for us in and of itself, but let's take a closer look. Uh, and I will drop the link to this one because this this is, again, proof of stuff they were running on ARPANET. Something I've been really hard pressed to find. When was this ran? 78. Uh, so terminology and overview sockets. I mean, this is so old that they, they didn't even have like the network model. They had the zero first and second level. Um, I'm not seeing anything immensely useful in this one. I think we're going to throw that one. I think we'll come back to that one. Is there anything else here? <sighs> All right. So let's go back to the network system. Because if we're going to do this correctly, let's, let's actually build a PDP-11 equivalent to what they would have actually been using back in the day. So let's find that list of let's find that list of hardware specs because this is going to tell me a lot of what we're going to have to try to do. It's a pity that we're going to go for all this work and we're still not going to actually be able to run it. All right, so here's the, here's the magic sentence right here. Uh, so PDP eleven hardware used it was a pdp 1150 not that that matters that much 2x rx05 drives uh mag tape drive 4x deck tape it's a lot of deck tape 32 uh core plus free terminals DH11 terminal multiplexer. I think I've seen all these drivers. So we have an MPO3 moving head disc. Twin platter RF11 fixed head. FPU, which was not a standard feature in those days. Um, one RX05 has root file system. Second RX05... Um, has login accounting. Okay. Base uh, 250 words memory. Okay, and so where do they put the temporary? Base operating system. The RF11, RF11 used as swap temporary file storage. Uh, 
Okay, so now we have a pre. I wonder if let's look at the configuration files for this again, because if we look at the cc dot c. Yeah. Okay. So this is definitely not the same system because the configuration is entirely different. You can see the RL0 here, but I do want to look at the RL0 driver. Like, could we just put two RL, RL1 drives on and kind of call it good? Because if that would work, then why wouldn't we do that? All right, so where would those drivers be? They would be in the DMR folder. Well, th there, there's a sentence you want to see. It doesn't minimize seek scheduling and totally ignores DEX bad block table in an error where you really didn't want to do that. Uh, so this came from UCSF. Uh, chat can figure out where that one came from. All right, let's see how this driver works. I think, yeah, it looks like this takes four drives in a bus. Like if we look at RK, yeah, okay, so that works the same way. So we can hook up to four RL drives, which gives us five megabytes of storage each on each one. That's definitely an improvement. See what else we've got to work with in this one. Oh, we have a symbol table for when you really need to debug. All right. Um, C tab, CC, build one. We probably will have to use a larger PDP 11, but again, it's not a make or break. Like, yeah, so here's a CD11 card reader. This is like a high-speed punch card reader. Still very... Those are common well into the 80s. Uh, this system has no concept of a frame buffer. So, no, it can't... It cannot run Doom. All right, so... Looking at our to-do list what else are we trying to figure out here so we know the type of hardware we need i want i want to get some links put aside for this because i want to be able to find this later so we we need the rl1 rl2 disk drive because this is one of the things that we will be running on and i am i should probably save you somewhere like if i do a save as I just put you on my desktop. PDP implementation notes. Yeah, you can save to my desktop. That's fine. So we grab that. So that's the disk drive we want. I think the second thing I want to look at is I want to look at the BSD disk packs. Although may installing those may or may not be a trivial undertaking like if i look for one b for the very early bsds and i mean like early i don't even know if those have been archived i mean that that's how old i'm talking here All right, yeah, so this is, that's not what I want. I need something a bit older than that. Let, let's let's dig into the historical Unix Society stuff. If we go into these, these are basically the archive of everything known to mankind as far as Unix goes. Like pretty much every copy here. So let's go to distributions. We want UBC because that's early Berkeley. And I'm already seeing something that concerns me. So one BSD would be what I would expect to see. What do we have 
in it. All right, so this is what I just downloaded. And there's a readme file. So extract, so, okay, so BSD Unix software tape. So this was a TP archive, but it's not a particularly big one. What utilities does this give us? It's like, does this give us a tar? We have EX. I don't think tar was a thing at this point yet. Like, yeah, there wasn't. So the way this would basically work is you would load this. You can see how this was. Um, most of the data on this tape has been archived to reduce the number of files. So TP will write it to this tape. You should extract the data from libraries. This will require about 100 blocks of storage if you don't remove each contain. Oh. I didn't think about that. That would work. Okay, so we were using, uh, so tar was the replacement for TP. Uh, and TP was the, t I believe it stands for tape program, but who knows. Um, it dies horribly if you give it like anything like a like i've tried even relatively simple directories and it just goes down in flames but if i were to pack all the files into ar archives that would work like that would completely work and then i could use that to extract i mean that it's a little bit messier than i would like But that would work. Let me see if I can find where TP is buried. Wow, it's actually written in assembly. It was probably like a deck utility from the manual. You want to know what's in the WoW file? Uh... That is a really tiny font. Can I make this bigger? Yes, I can. So here's here's what was on. So yeah, so WoW looks like it's just a modified readme, but actually it, it's a format readme. So it gives us a new editor, gives us a modified shell, a new shell, a Star Trek game. Ooh. God, Star Trek would have still been on. When did Star Trek go off the air? Like the original series, when did it go off the air? Okay, Star Trek was already off the air at that point, but it would have been less than 10 years. I think the movies would have been out by that point, though. Uh, when was Star Trek the motion picture? It would have just come out. The original, the original Star Trek movie motion picture would have just come out when that came out <laughs> i like that i i'm sorry that that i i love star trek i grew up with it it amuses me a lot i'd be kind of tempted to resurrect the pascal stuff in here but um i don't think I think this is actually all that useful. I mean, there's definitely some rather neat things. And the tip about using AR as a last resort, that 
that is a major major win i'd probably have that it's still going to be a giant obnoxious pain how many subdirectories in here i mean we could do it it would not be fun but we could do it i almost would want to like write a shell script now that could do it uh star trek ran for three seasons not just one uh all right you know what just because i am curious like i i need to I'm, i just want to see if we can do something let's let's uh if I want, to, how do if uh let's see here find name type D. Uh, if I want to find like if I want every subdirectory, find uh, directories only. Uh, let's see here. I need recursive. Uh, well, I guess. I mean, that doesn't really help me. I need a recursive command to find all the uh, directories. Because what I could do is we could pack all these into AR files. I could probably even do that on a modern system. Like, the AR format has not, like, like I wouldn't even be surprised if the AR utility from Mac OS X would make an R AR file that ancient Unix could unpack. Uh, so let's let's add our for potential options. Uh, I don't. This is not a YAML file. Why do you think this is a YAML file? So potential options, options for data transfer. Uh, pack files in AR and use TP to write a data tape. Dig out more updated v6 and use tar ick uh patch in rl driver and transfer from v7 unix uh because the rl would potentially be big enough i mean it would be yeah it would be big enough i just have to delete a couple of files to make it fit like i'd have to get rid of all the dot o files but we could get under we could get it under five megabytes that's not a big deal i'm kind of leaning to using this option although this is going to require some scripting um but it's entirely doable Like, I probably could just write a Python script in, like, 20 minutes. Well, not 20 minutes, but a, longer than that. That would just list out all the commands, and we could do it that way. So, what else is there? Like, what other things do I really want to look here? We are going to live stream tomorrow. Um, I might start live streaming during the week again while I'm doing this research project. I'm not CERN. How long have we been streaming for? We're coming up on the six hour mark. Um, although we're at 144, which is not a bad place. Let me see what else we can do with this. There is one thing I do actually want to find out and we might as well do it now i want to know if v6 and v7 can actually exchange files or i shouldn't say exchange files but um what's the magic word i'm looking for 
Let me make sure I don't have any running PDP. Oh, I have a lot of PDP sessions running. So let's just, you know, kill them all. Who cares about file corruption? Uh, yeah, so PDP 11. And let me just make this big. Because I, I just don't feel like using the terminal right now. So PDP 11. Uh, end boot here. All right. Uh, so the question I am wondering, so if I do, we do a control E and I copy in like a disk pack from V6. Can I mount it? Because then that'll tell me the file systems are in fact compatible. Uh, which would be actually quite useful to know because that that will affect affect the options so rk1 test uh, attach rk1 rk1 test okay go uh, mount Oh, I, I only have RK0 here. Um, make uh, make node dev RK1 block 01. It probably, yeah, I did actually boot the wrong kernel. Let's see here. Boot RP0. Because if they if these can share files, that at least makes a lot of things easier. If not, we'll have to use like one of the. Oh, that was completely not what I wanted to do. I wanted to start H. I wanted to start RP Unix, not this. And why is it like? Why am I having buffer hangs? I shouldn't. Fortunately, it helps when you can remotely kill the other system. Probably just need to reboot stuff at this point. Let's see here. Boot. So, L case, RP0, LP0. There we go. Let's see if we can mount this because this this is going to define a lot of what we can do. Block errors. Oh, um attach RP1. Attach RP1 RP1 test. Oops, that was not what I wanted to do. Bad directory. Okay. Well, I get the distinct feeling that these are not compatible. Uh, before I say that definitively, though... here be sick uh let's see here test i'm just gonna make sure absolutely certain that let's see here attach rp1 rp1 test
Memory fault. Okay, so I'm guessing the file system between V6 and V7 changed. Because, of course, it did. That's really kind of irritating, but fine. Uh, let me add that as a note. Appears FS between V6, V7 incompatible. Yeah, okay, that's, that's kind of a bit depressing. So I'm thinking we're going to have to do the ARTP thing. Or we're going to have to try and use the updated v6 of the tar command i don't i think those are the i think those are quite literally the only two options unless i can pat well you know what before i say those are the only two options we might be able to patch the tp command to be less stupid i don't know if that's a legitimate possibility but i mean obviously there were pro this obviously this was a real problem back in the day so that that was actually a huge win looking at that i might as well look at the other bsd ones because maybe there's some more hints on how this all was you know used Uh, let's see here. All right, so BSD two. BSD two has something really nice in it. I see a tar command. All right, so read me. Uh, install setup. Yeah, so, okay, so this is basically an update kit. So BSD2.2 uh, two is an update kit. And I, I kind of knew this because look at the dates. This is from, we, we've got 79 dates all around here. So let's look at the documentation. And you can definitely see how some of the things have changed. We have a newer mail command. We have an updated EX. We have Vi. Oh man, imagine having Vi. What a quality of life that would be. And then there's Pascal. So what's in the readme directory that might actually help? Binaries for a standard system. Seashell. Seashell seashells by the seashore. Oh, I like that. A lib retro for. I don't know if anything in this is actually useful. Like, or I should say directly useful. Term cap. That's one of the first appearances of term cap. Um, let's just read the install file. Uh, choose application. You're really going to make me do it this way? All applications. Uh, text edit, please. Second distribution of the Berkeley software for Unix. It's interesting how that's, it's called Berkeley software. All right. I mean, I could format this, but... By following the directions here, you should be able to bring the software on the tape um, in a very short period of time, ranging from about an hour to about six hours. Okay. Okay, 
Okay, so once again, they had to do the... Um, if your tape was written with Tar or Scipio, it was... Um, so CPIO was a thing in this time period. Do we have a copy of it? Like, if we could get CPIO, that would actually be kind of a big deal. Like, I don't think CPIO was in... I mean, we have AR. Do we... I don't think we have a copy... I mean, this is definitely not one of the TP-based tapes because it's been all extracted. But I am sort of thinking I want to build a BSD system because it would be considerably less annoying to work on. Like, when was CPIO added to Unix? Like, where did that come from? We know TAR came from V7. Where did CPIO come from? It was in the programmer's workbench. Oh, there's the, that was an answer I was not expecting. So, um, CPIO is a little bit of an interesting... Um, programmer's workbench is kind of an offshoot of unix that has more or less been forgotten to my knowledge there's no surviving copy no complete surviving copies there are a few that have made it partially like this is where sccs came from there's cpio there's find and other ones like is there any of actually it looks like there might be a distribution like if we could get a cpio command that would actually be huge. Where is that buried? So USDL. Incomplete versions of some of um, some bell tapes. Let's see if there's an actual copy of CPIO on here. Because if there's a cop if, if there's a version of CPIO I can build, that that would actually be amazing. So here, let's take a look and see what we've got here. We've got I don't even know where it would be. I guess it would be in the root. CPIO. So there is a CPIO binary here. Like, like dynamic linking was not a thing in this time period. So potentially I could just take it, put it on a standalone tape and it would work? I mean, there is updated Unix kernels here. I can see that just looking at this. There's the HP, but that's not a deal breaker. I mean, it doesn't look like they've shipped the full source. There's potential in this. Is there an install anything here that tells me how I install this? Right. <sighs> Looking at the readme. Uh, for the file dates. So it's the out programmers. Sections of the tarball is correct. Contents are scrambled. PBI1, PBI5 is same. Uh, 
it probably would need it's like we've got options which is actually quite a good thing let me think about this programmers programmers workbench unix probably has additional system calls I mean, you could do develop. I mean, you're expected to do development work on V6 Unix, but if you're going to make it real friendly, I am thinking. I am thinking packing the files in with AR and then using TP to write the pack is the way to go here. I mean, it's probably the closest way to period correct distribution. I am thinking I want to wrap up the stream at this point. Like it's I've been up since midnight. I don't if I'm going to stream tomorrow, I don't want to be completely dead. So, um, we're pretty deep in this Unix rabbit hole, but I'm sort of seeing daylight at the end of the tunnel, although it could be very much a fast approaching train. What I will do between streams is I'm going to do a little shell scripting to basically generate the AR um, to try and do this option to pack the files in AR and TP. We're going to then probably have to patch in, well, we may not have to patch in the t the RL driver, but it's probably not a bad idea. I mean, we got the RP one working, although God knows we beat our head on repeatedly doing it. Um, And then we'd have to compile it. But we could entirely do this. I mean, I'm gonna pull the I'm gonna pull the audience here. Um, I just want to see if you folks want to see me continue tomorrow. Like, I might start doing some midweek streams because it's a lot easier to focus when I'm on air. There's no distractions. Uh, I don't have the hardware for AIX and Itanium. Um, it has been booted. Uh, Tenox managed to do it. Um, we've got partially got GCC going last time I looked. But no one's completely sure why it only boots on one specific machine. There's definitely going to be more streams. Like I want, like I said, I really want to build a lot of the ARPANET stuff, but I I think there's going to be a dedicated video relating to this. All right, um, because I think there's enough content here to talk about bootstrapping a 50 year old system from scratch. Yeah, I think I'm going to wrap this up. So uh, I guess this is going to be our last call. If you've enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. If you really enjoy this content, consider becoming a Patreon or supporting me on Coffee with the links in the description. We are going to stream again tomorrow, again starting at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and I might start doing some week streaming. I want to see how far... I really want to see how far I can take this and... I guess beyond that, we're going to probably end up making a, a video out of this. I, I can't see how we're not. So, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I'm going to just wait for the chat lag to catch up because you guys are quite a bit behind me.
but yeah, I think I think I think three and a half hours of streaming is not a bad place to be. Mostly, I I need to think on this, and I'm just gonna be staring at the screen for like the next hour. And if we're going tomorrow, I think this is a good stopping point. Uh, RH11 should be. Yep, yeah, that is correct. That should actually be a DH11. Uh, that is an amazing catch. I can't believe you actually got that. So, yeah, once again, keep an eye on the channel. Um, keep an eye on my socials as well because I will announce things and resources.